um, due to COVID, uh, level three COVID-19 restrictions, it's not possible for the South Warrior District Council to conduct this meeting with members and the public physically present. Uh, so participating members, uh, all participating members count for the purpose of the meeting quorum in accordance with clause 25B of the Schedule 7 of the Local Government Act 2002. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and made available on the Council's YouTube channel via a link to the Council's website. We will be discussing uh, some conditions around that um, um, after this meeting um, as raised by um, with me with um, uh, Rebecca Councillor Fox. A summary of the meeting will also be made available on the Council's website shortly following the meeting in accordance with Clause 47A of the Local Government Information Act and Meetings Act 1987. So also we welcome uh, Raihania Tapoki uh, to the meeting. Raihania is the Maori Standing Committee Chair and is able to participate in Council debate as per the Council's terms of reference. Uh, we also welcome, we have invited uh, other members of the Maori Standing Committee and the community boards. Um, and we acknowledge the importance of our boards and committee and, enable them, and enabling them to listen to the debate and discussions today ensures that they are up to speed on council business. And also, please bear in mind that whilst there have been later agenda items and a limited time to consider some documents, we do acknowledge the difficult circumstances of the council officers and staff that, they have been, that they've been working under. And with this in mind, we will run a longer meeting with extended discussion so that all councillors are comfortable with the information that has been provided and their ability to absorb it. Uh, with this in mind, we will now move on to the uh, full agenda, which is the South Waiba District Council affirmation. And uh, Councillor Maynard, would you like to read the affirmation for us? With no warning at all. <laughs> Pip, you're on. Oh, God. Yeah, no, no problem. I, but I was on mute, so I thought I'd better. <laughs> um, so we pledge that we will faithfully and impartially use our skill, wisdom, and judgment throughout discussions and deliberations ahead of us today, in order to make responsible and appropriate decisions for the benefit of the South Wadded Upper District at large. We commit individually and as a council to the principles of integrity and respect and to upholding the vision and values we have adopted in our long-term plan strategic document in order to energize, unify, and enrich our district. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Uh, we have no apologies, A1. Uh, A2, conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest to declare? And none. Thank you, people. None. Um, acknowledgements and tributes. Are there any acknowledgements or tributes that we need to... Uh, yes, Councillor Maynard. Um, I'd just like to um, um, uh, make a, a, a small tribute to Pat Halton. Um, so she was a Martinborough local who helped to um, enrich our community, I guess, through performing arts. Um, she was someone that really drove uh, our Martinborough and District's Company of Amateur Players, or MADCAPS, um, for many years, um, going, back, going back to the early 80s. Um, and, and her family um, are all well known here um, within, within the Martinborough community and district-wide. And so I'd just like to make that tribute to her um, for all of, the, all of the work and uh, the influence, I guess, that she holds uh, on many, on many people throughout throughout this area. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Do we have any other tributes? People who have passed away. I'd also like to acknowledge the passing of uh, Sandra Prince of Martinborough, who uh, was an early leader in, in um, setting up of accommodation and tourism in in Martinborough, who died very swiftly. Uh, it was at uh, the week before last, so I'm sure we very much missed this one. Right. We would like to public participation. I don't think we have any public participation, so we'll move from that. Uh, extraordinary business. So we have one item of extraordinary business. <clears throat> Officers are recommending that the local government funding agency report is considered at this meeting. This was late due to an administrative error. 
and cannot be delayed as the resolution to sign needs to be made by the 30th of April. Uh, do we have a mover to um, accept this extraordinary business? Uh, thank you, Councillor Plimmer and seconder. Councillor Ems, thank you very much. All those in favour, please say aye. Oh, okay. Aye. So aye. I'm about I'm about to do this is a new protocol. So I'm about to ask for a vote. So if you could unmute yourselves. <laughs> Although, and it's you as well, Ross. Okay. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those aye. against. So the motion is carried. Uh, we will now put this in as agenda item number B5. Right, and also uh, at this point, I was wondering whether our um, Māori Standing Committee Chair Raihane Atapokia has any comments to Council, understanding that there has not been a Māori Standing Committee meeting uh, since our past meeting. Raihane. Oh, kia ora, Alex. Tēnā koutou. Thanks for having me today. Uh, just a slight correction with the pronunciation of my surname, Alex, it's Tipoki. Tipoki, thank you. Uh, the guidelines of the Māori Dictionary. Uh, tipoki. tipoki. Oh, kia ora, everybody. Um, yeah, nice to see everyone and know that business is still underway. Um, I guess in terms of reporting back from the Māori community, uh, it's really mixed bag out there, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, many of us are, are quite happy to be locked down away from uh, society and others are fretting and stressing over the, you know, the lockdown, but probably, probably more so moving out of lockdown when the wage subsidies start to uh, crumble away and, and the challenges become even more real, prolonged. Um, so, I think I've kind of, my head's been in the, the recovery uh, phase space for almost the entire period of lockdown because I could see it's an opportunity for us to make some real changes um, heading into the future. Um, for us as Māori, we, we consider the status quo problematic, so anyone suggesting a return to normality, uh, we like to challenge them. Challenge, challenge them to help them understand that the normal uh, for them is, is still abnormal for us and it's a normality that we have been striving to correct for, for generations. Since the recovery from colonisation continues, we'll be looking to move past uh, recovery and into a new way of being, uh, a more just way of being on our land, um, a, a more just way of existing. Uh, with our treaty partner, and yeah, so 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 for me, I'm encouraging uh, the rest of our Maori leaders to look for the levers, look for those change levers that will surely be coming up um, as the government continues to decide what exactly this economic stimulus package or strategy to reboot. The economy will look like. Um, so I've been talking with people at the, uh, my friends at the Iwi Leaders Forum, um, others in other departments and uh, positions of power to get to get knowledge and uh, strategize strategize our people nationally and regionally and of course uh, locally. So. Just a little bit of news from what we've been up to. Um, yeah, we were, we've been involved in the newly established collaborative called Core Wairarapa Tene, which means this is Wairarapa. Comes from a waiata composed a couple of decades ago. And it talks about unity, something as Wairarapa Māori we've failed to achieve um, for too long. Uh, so interestingly, COVID-19 gave us a good kick up the arse and realise we need to be looking after our people and especially our most vulnerable who are, yeah, who have already been paying the price, um, someone else's price. Uh, and now 
they are you know much much worse off. So we've been delivering food packages, uh, firewood hygiene packs, and things like that. We've cl it's, it's actually been quite amazing, and I'm really excited to be part of a um, a Wairarapa Kotahitanga collaborative uh, united movement to to help to help and support our people. So. The delivering and just really, we knew we knew who our people were, especially here in the south. We knew who our, our most vulnerable. Brought. Well, we got on the phones, we checked, we kept, we're still checking in with them, asking them what they need. Hopefully, providing you, you know, usually providing those things they've needed, whether that be from the iwi, the DHB, fire order, other providers, or just straight from our own freezers, the lake, the sea, the land, wherever. So now moving forward, we're looking at opportunities locally too. On what are the things we could do to feed our people when they get hungry? What are the things we can do to help house our people if they struggle? Uh, all those kind of things. Um, so the MSD has been really helpful. Ministry for Social Development has given us some money. Uh, the, I know Paiti Mokai, Hawariki, uh, Kohanu is just applied. Uh, just applying today actually. And we've, in our charitable tr trust, Te Rua Mahara applied and we've got some money for a garden, so we're going to do. I haven't really talked to much many of the Lake Fury community, but we're going to, we want to establish a community garden here at Lake Fury, along with uh, chickens, so we can. So yeah, you know, this is actually really relevant for you guys because uh, I think we should be looking at how we can use the waste, our household waste, and put it back um, into the ground so we can eat. You know, utilize it utilize the energy in that, in that waste to eat. So we're, I've been collecting the, the pig, some of the pig scraps from our people in Lake Fury and feeding our pigs, because when the Lake Fury Hotel shut, um, it was the only way I was gonna keep my piglets alive. So that's where I thought, shit, we should have a garden here, we should have chooks, potentially, potentially pigs, and then all of the community can bring, can, can sort their food scraps into whether that's chips for chickens, compost, or pigs bring it down here and they can feel a part of the co-op of it benefiting uh, all of us and especially our landfill uh, removal of stuff from our landfill. So yeah, um, and then at Kohanu we're going to do the same regardless of whether we get that funding. We've got uh, plans for a massive orchard, more like a food forest. Uh, they're getting a, we're getting a chicken coop up there as well and a pig, a pig pen, definitely a pig pen up there. And then we're going to get some of the community, the Piti Noa community, to buy into that co-papa and bring their waste down, sort it, um, leave it with us, and then we do the feeding. Um, and they can opt in whether to receive benefits from from dropping their food scraps off. Uh, well, I'm not sure how how you know how much we'd be able to give, or or just say you know we're happy for the um, for the food produced from the scraps to go to the vulnerable regardless of whether they're in the south or the upper or the north. So those, those are some of the things that I've, I've been up to and I've been encouraging our, our other leaders to get involved with. Um, so while, you know, the country's in an economic shock, I think there's a lot of us who are seeing this as a huge opportunity to make some real changes that will benefit everybody. Um, so yeah, te nakutu. I, uh, Rohani, I thank you. Uh, Steph, we can make sure that this is a regular agenda item uh, at our council meetings as well. Um, right, moving now on to um, uh, item number A7, minutes for confirmation. Um, uh, Suzanne, have there been any corrections to the 18th of March minutes? No, the, the, one, the minutes that are in front of you are what we are receiving and confirming. Right, excellent. Now, do we have a mover that the minutes of the council meeting held on the 18th of March 2020 are a true and correct record? Do we have a mover? Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Seconded, Councillor Hay. Thank you. All those in favour, please say aye. Oh, sorry, I'm about to aye, <laughs> ask aye. for a vote. <laughs> aye. All aye. those in favour, please say aye. 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 Has Garrick disappeared? Garrick is not here for the vote. Uh, all those against? The motion is carried. Right, councillors, do we have any comments on the minutes? No one? Uh, Councillor Ems, we're just um, asking if there are any comments of the minutes 
of the council meeting held on the 18th of March 2020. Right. Okay. Uh, the, um, now moving on, are there any corrections? Uh, sorry, uh, Suzanne, are there any corrections to the 25th of March minutes? Uh, no, they're as um, per your agenda pack as they were distributed. Fantastic. Do I have a mover that the minutes of the council meeting held on the 25th of March 2020 are a true and correct? record. So, am I getting out of... Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, our true and correct record. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Seconded, Councillor Fox. I'm about to ask for a vote. So if you unmute uh, yourself. Aye. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against. Aye. Thank you. The motion has uh, is carried. Uh, right, you have also received, so we're doing a big catch up here, have you, you have also received a copy of the table minutes from the 22nd of April or last week. Uh, Suzanne, are there any corrections to the 22nd of April minutes? No, they were as distributed to you and, um, and Mr Wilson to have a look at. Right, cool. Uh, do we have a mover that the minutes of the council meeting held on the 22nd of April 2020 are a true and correct record? Thank you, moved by Councillor Jepson, seconded thank you by Councillor Plymouth. Or oh, I'm about to ask for a vote. I can unmute you, mute yourself. Uh, Pam, Brenda, good. All those aye. in favour, please say aye. 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 All those aye. against, the motion is carried. Great. Right. We're moving briskly along, but I'm sure that will change. Uh, these, we're now moving to B1, Decision Report to the Chief Executive and Staff, which is the South Wairarapa Spatial Plan Program. Uh, do we have, so we are now considering the report um, regarding the South Wairarapa Spatial Plan Program and Enhanced Community Engagement Proposal. Uh, do we have a mover to receive the report? Thank you, Councillor Fox, and a seconder. Councillor Ems, thank you very much. I'm about to ask for a vote. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, the motion is carried. Uh, right, Mr Wilson, do you have a comment on the report and have there been any changes since the, resort, the uh, report was last presented to Council? There've been no changes, um, but in terms of introducing it, so this is, um, you recall earlier pre-COVID, which seems a long time ago, um, we wanted to make sure that we were lining up the long-term plan and the geospatial plan in a way that would make sense to be actively consult with our community. The concern at the time was the present time frame for the spatial plan coincided with the annual plan consultation. And given that the community has limited bandwidth to process a great deal of information, if we wanted to get good community participation, we need to do that in a, in a way that, um, where there was more opportunity to participate. So the, um, this report set, essentially sets out an enhanced community and stakeholder engagement plan that lines up those two activities. Um, so um, you have the detail before you, and I'm sure you've all had the opportunity to go through this. Um, if there are any questions in terms of the consultation detail, Mr O'Leary will be pleased to um, provide some information. Excellent. Thank you, Mr Wilson. Uh, do we have any questions of councillors, please? Uh, sorry, Councillor West first. Um, I just got a quick query about the total cost for the survey on this one. Um, at the end of the survey, can we have an updated costing of how much it actually cost rather than a um, indicative figure? Uh, yes, you would. You would get that reported, um, particularly through the Planning and um, Regulatory Committee. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hay. Uh, so am I addressing these questions to Russell, maybe, or Harry? Um, I just uh, wanted to know, how many research companies did you go out to to seek advice on the type of market research that might be appropriate? 
Russell, you able to answer that question? Yeah. Yeah, Councillor, um, that has, I've taken guidance from Rhea Anderson in terms of uh, what work she's done in the past and uh, research agencies, and she's gone with uh, Phoenix, who she's done close work with. So there's natural affinity with that. So we've gone with what has arisen from me having that discussion with her and with Phoenix, Phoenix Group has been strongly suggested as the, as the research agency. Um, so I just wonder about some of the methodology of the market research and I wonder whether potentially we might get a sharper quote post-COVID uh, and it might be worthwhile going to two or three different market research companies. Um, as an example for the uh, logo research, we, uh, we use Key Research, uh, which is based in Tauranga, I think. Um, and they were quite innovative in the approach. And the other issue is overlaying this where there's an opportunity to also involve councillors um, in seeking feedback in some sort of structured way. Um, but I believe there might be an opportunity for some um, a bit of a rethink on the methodology and possibly an opportunity to have a bit of sharper pricing. Uh, our research for the logo was sent to 400 people and we had a 40% uptake and that research I think from memory cost about 18,000 so just a thought. Councillors, do we have any other questions? Oh sorry, oh, sorry I'll uh, let um, uh, uh, Russell respond to that possibly. Thank you Councillor. Um, yeah note that Note your point, um, there's always room for um, reviewing potential costs and I can, I can take that um, point up. And uh, also within uh, what, is, what is the need to keep um, the community boards informed and, count, and potentially councillors um, for <coughs> ideas for um, ideas desks or, uh, within libraries for um, questions to be posed with the public. And um, so we really do want to mix, a, a combined mix, to, to get the good results, we want a combined mix of an online survey, um, a stakeholder uh, interface for more depth, and also uh, pop-up desks at the likes of libraries to, to, uh, to add to the feedback that we we can get so, but I take on board the comments um, made um, in terms of looking more sharply at costs and providing an update. Councillors, any other councillors? Uh, Councillor Evans, thank you. And then, uh, then uh, Councillor Plimmer. <clears throat> yeah, just a general question, Russell. Uh, looking at the timetable on page, uh, on, on my page 12, we you've got a pretty hefty workload going through from April um, and, and involving a lot of people. Uh, can we do this under level three or are we uh, going to go to level two? And, and Because I mean, there's a lot of talking and meetings and I'm worried about you guys having to sit around and listen to us. So we do have time there for it? I think Russell's just reviewing that councillor ends. Oh, thank you. He's frozen. Sorry, he's frozen. Um, In terms of the time frames, they they are. I'm sorry, Russell, it looks like you have frozen, you have a connection issue. Um, in um, Russell's frozen state, possibly, um, Harry, have you got any comments that may be applicable to that question? Yes, uh, but, um, so we, we're doing our best in terms of what we think um, might be able to happen. 
Obviously, if the level three extends further, um, we would have to revise this time frame. But the intent is to get to the end date um, so that we're laying things up for the LTP. So we'll just have to um, do our best, um, depending on um, how things play out in terms of changes to alert levels. Okay, so, so the October date is set in concrete? None of the, none. Okay, that's all right. And none of the okay. dates are set in concrete. We just have to, I mean, this is an indicative time frame. Um, we, obviously, if we, the, the drop dead date is to try and get stuff lined up for the LTP. Um, and so we'd have to truncate some of the processes um, if, if we end up in a place where we can't get face-to-face -face or survey information. Thank, thank you. Uh, Councillor Plymouth, then Councillor Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I suppose this is a bit to you, Harry. Um, given that we're in a, uh, a, a situation which we don't know what the future looks like um, and we don't know what the economic impact upon the district is going to be, uh, this report was written before we went into lockdown, before COVID came around. Um, has, has, have you guys given any thought to perhaps uh, having a relook at this uh, in light of given the, uh, the focus for council really needs to be on economic recovery going forward more than uh, perhaps some of these issues? Um, yes, we have. So um, the, the economic recovery, as far as we can see, um, and I mean, this is a crystal ball kind of thing, is that we're still in a good place to support growth. Um, so yes, there will be impact on small and medium sized businesses, but the basic levers that drive um, the economy here um, are still, still driving. You know, so we still have a strong primary production sector. We still have strong viticulture. Um, we're picking the domestic tourism, tourism will change. So the things that um, enable growth are still things we need to plan for. Thank you, Harry. Uh, our councillor, um, councillor Fox. Thank you, Mayor Bayon. Just um, councillor Plimmer actually asked some of the questions that I was going to ask. But harking back to looking at focus groups, um, I think we could carry out focus groups in level three. Uh, really, my question relates to though: Have we considered in any of this actually using local facilitators and? Uh, other people who have got some really good experience with this and connecting with our local communities already and have those networks in place. It seems to me that we just are, are using uh, Auckland-based research company when there are probably some folks that are local that have got some extraordinary skills in this space and they're existing already and I just don't see any reference to them in the report. We, we would want to use local people and part of the intent here is to drive it through um, our community boards to make sure that there's good, strong community presence. Um, the the, uh, the survey um, can be done anywhere from the country, but the things like facilitating focus groups, we also mm. want to use people who've had experience with um, geospatial planning. Um, Re really is probably one of the best in New Zealand to actually help with that. She had familiarity with the Auckland Spatial Plan, even though it's a different scale, but um, yeah. it's about lessons learned as well. So it's a mix. Um, okay. No, that's good. Thank you. Councillors, do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, Councillor Colenso. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I would like to ask the question. Um, I see that we are going to survey 18 year olds and over. What provision has been made in this for surveying um, our college students, um, not just at Kurunui, but at the at the South Wairapa students that are at other colleges to get their input into this because the spatial plan is for long term and basically some of those people are going to be the young people that are, are looking to come back um, into our community and also um, are, are wanting to, to use the facilities to, um, to carry out businesses and things like that and I think their input is is equally as important as the adults in the in the community. I couldn't agree more. Um, so we we'll just have to make sure the methodology does capture that. I'm, I'm sure it's not a um, an intent to be exclusive to 18 year olds only, but I will just make sure that it actually happens. Thank you. I'll be... Alex. 
Hi, sorry. Before, uh, Rahani, before we move to you, uh, can we just see if Russell is now back online and able to answer questions or whether we're still going through Harry for this? Okay, Harry will, oh, Russell, um, are you able now to answer, I uh, continue answering questions or would you prefer Harry to come? I, no, I can answer the um, questions along with um, CE if, if they wish it. Oh. Okay, uh, Rahani. Oh, kia ora, Russell. Hey, um, I haven't, I've been out of the loop a bit with the spatial plan. Um, how much involvement have you had from our Māori community, if any, and, and who's helping you, you know, in that space? Yep, uh, the proposal is to uh, keep um, Māori Standing Committee um, updated and in the loop, but also to have uh, further contact with yourself as to seek out the best avenue for for that consultation. So we've we've had discussions in the past, but I need I need to uh, seek some guidance um, as as Re has mentioned to me, and as I've tried to remember is that we we seek guidance from yourself and uh, for best approaches for um, getting that taking the questions to iwi groups and. Part of that is gaining your your advice or input on that. And have we have we missed the bus at all in terms of you know having influence? Uh, no, certainly not, because um, <laughs> to topics covered in the spatial plan are very wide. It's a very it's a very wide, all encompassing topic. So uh, aspirational values that you would you seek to raise and remind us of um, have to be captured. So we're we want to be capturing that in the best best way in terms of who you think we should make the links with. Okay, so um, yeah, let's let, uh, Russell, but I, I do need to say that you know historically, right up to this point, um, the ability of Māori to engage in council processes has, has been extremely limited, due essentially to the lack of resourcing. Uh, I have, as I'm sure a lot of you know, I wear many different hats um, and the council, the Māori Standing Committee hat I'm wearing is uh, shrinking, uh, which means uh, my ability to wear it properly uh, is compromised. Um, and if that's compromised, it's compromising our ability as a Māori community um, to take our destiny into our own hands. So what I'm saying is, we need to rethink how we engage with council um, at both the governance and operation level. Uh, I've been talking to my, constitu my constituents and uh, colleagues about this very issue. Um, it's very serious and we're looking at all sorts of different options. Um, so I'm just letting you guys know that things have to change uh, or else things might change a bit more than what you think <laughs> without your consent. Um, uh, Rahani, are we uh, you talking, sorry to interrupt, but are you discussing with regards to specifically the spatial plan uh, and the consultation document, or is this a general uh, comment? It's, it's pretty general, but it, it goes, you know, it's definitely the spatial plan, I feel, Alex, is, is an opportunity for us to really take, hot, take the ball by the horns in terms of us our visions for the future coming into reality. Um, historically, our visions for the future have, have been impeded uh, by the visions of others. Talk about colonisation for you to understand what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, just simply that we need to change things and I'm ready for those conversations. Kia ora, Russell. Kia ora. Yeah. Uh, perhaps in, in a discussion that, you know, if you look at the timeline with regards to the spatial plan, this is going out to June 2021. So there is a lot of time for your input uh, and even your discussions regarding changing the, the methodology uh, all the way it's done. And I'm sure Russell will be more than happy to accommodate those discussions or if you bring them by the um, Murray Standing Committee. Uh, Russell, Harry, do you have any comments on that? No, we're up to that kind of conversation, um, absolutely. We just want to make sure that we um, get all input from everyone. Um, but we do particularly recognise the place of Tangata Whenua, Mana Whenua, and the significance um, the spatial planning has. And so we do want to make sure we, we do the best 
på det här Councillor Fox. Thanks, Mayor Bain. Uh, just reflecting back on a statement in the report that regional public health have offered to provide staff with tools, for example, health equity assessment tool. Um, my background, of course, is in public health, and one of my observations has been that public health often has a seat at the end of the table, um, not dissimilar to our Māori partners, in fact. And I just wanted to understand um, how that health equity assessment tool is going to be brought through the spatial planning process. Will public health be at the table for the majority of those conversations or be used basically as a, an equity lens, as it were, at the end of the process? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, the intent is uh, to continue on the initial with the initial feedback re received from regional public health and I've We've sat down with them in person, and so their ongoing input is will will be captured. Uh, we've we've given that commitment um, to reps, uh, the staff reps that I met with, and we'll continue to do that. Realising that that the social and social and health lens needs to be captured for uh, best outcomes. It will. Thanks, Russell. And there'll potentially be some more changes in that space. So it's just good to know that they're being carried through, not at the end. Cool. Thanks. And councillors, any other questions? If I may possibly pose a question as well, pose a question as well. Uh, um, yeah, I having reviewed this very carefully, um, I am conscious that it, it, I would really like to see the methodology challenged or investigated as being robust. There have been changes in um, this, this societal uh, framework over COVID and, and um, whether or not this plan is too traditional. Uh, I'm particularly nervous when I see a survey or a research project which include, includes uh, telephone interviewing and especially with a cost of 45,000 attached to that. Uh, so I'm wondering whether or not we would have the option or the ability to review methodology and costing using a uh, perhaps a select number of um, invited tenderers. Um, but I'm concerned, Russell, and you may be able to point on this, what that might do to our key steps to the spatial plan and how that might delay some of our key deliverables. Russell. Um. Thank you, Your Worship. The uh, option for it is being undertaken. Um, so there was no uptake in terms of the uh, phone, the phone survey. What what's being pursued is the uh, online online survey, and combined with to add more depth, so that you get breadth and depth, that you have a stakeholder interface and have more in depth quick questioning with the selection of stakeholders. So the, the, the telephone survey is off the list. We're going for a, for the option four, which was the combined survey together with stakeholder interface. And then that will be followed up by uh, town meetings plus um, pop-up desks for, of information um, at libraries as well. So we think we've got the canvas uh, or approach quite broad. Um, hopefully that hopefully that will um, answer your question or in part. Um, well, there are two parts to that. One is whether or not there's the ability to have this critiqued to ensure that we're making the best decisions on engagement. Um, you know, and also if there was a critiquing to occur, uh, whether that would delay our our, our process. Plan. I I think you've identified a quite a constraining point in terms of if we add that uh, a serious critiquing component, then it will push things out. Councillors, do you have any other opinions regarding whether or not we should be looking at confirmation um, of process or methodology? Councillor Fox. Uh, 
thank you, uh, Mayor Bain. Yeah, I, I do. I, I understand that it's an issue that we might uh, constrain um, process um, Russell or, or timelines, but I also think that we could be significantly criticised as a council for not taking the time to consult properly. And having recently been through an extraordinarily long consultation process, which everyone thought would take two years and it actually took five, um, I'm not suggesting that this should take five years, but I think that it's really important that we do make some consideration for critiquing the report. And maybe some of that can actually be time bound. Um, just so that we can ensure that we are getting the best information for our community. I don't like the idea that we're going to land on something which could be quite narrow in focus. Mm. And if we don't look at it robustly enough, we could end up in that space. It's no criticism of what you put forward right now, but it's really an observation. And I do very much echo your um, main thoughts there. Um, Councillor Maynard. Um, kia ora. I just wanted to, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Also uh, agree. I think I think you've raised some really, um, really good points there, um, Mayor Alex. And I, I, you know, you know, possibly I, I understand. I think Harry also raised a good point when, if these additional things, you know, if if we can still know what that end goal is, then perhaps even by putting them in, we may still make it to that end goal. I don't think. Um, you know, um, a, a couple of additional steps would would make too much of a difference. My one concern would be costings, and with what our nation is going through at the moment, I guess um, re really any kind of cost savings, um, which bounces back to, I, I think all of the councillors have brought something to the table today and with what Councillor Hay had already uh, raised about, about looking at that side of things, it may actually change, I guess, by, by looking into the, the things that um, Mayor Alex has, has raised, um, could actually change the whole scope a little bit more um, and, and perhaps open it up for for tagging into some, some of our um, people here locally who may be able to provide some information and also um, those statistics that we're looking for. So that's it. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Um, any other councillors? Thank you, Councillor Hay. Sorry about that. Um, just in terms of the time, what it might impact on the time frame. Uh, again, when we were doing calling proposals for market research companies, I think we had four different companies, and we got their uh, reports within less than two weeks. So I don't know whether that. Um, it would have a major impact on timing and it would, as Pip said, allow certainty when we get um, uh, some of our constituents if they question us on this. I think we can, with hand on heart, say we've gone out to the market to get a competitive price and also to critique the methodology. Uh, so again, Russell, it's a, you've done a massive amount of work, but um, the world's a bit different right now and I think... Uh, when we look at how we tend for other bits of our business, we normally do get two or three quotes. So in my view, this process is not too different. Uh, that's, sorry, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the caution, I think we need to do this properly. Um, it may be that prices come back more expensive if we feel that given what has happened in, uh, in our post uh, during COVID world means that we need to change or increase the scope or some comments that we've had from Rohania, uh, whether or not we need to really drill down into certain areas. So I think the important thing here is that we are following due process and, and actively and properly engaging with our community. Uh, cost is, is only one factor of that. And I think we could um, uh, hurt ourselves if we went for a cheap option that doesn't achieve what the community need. Um, councillors, any other councillors have any comment regarding this? Councillor um, Vickery. Apologies. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think the, the, the general feeling here is that we must get this right. And it's hard to see what shape the world is going to be in two or three years' time. 
I'm reasonably relaxed that the time frame could be pushed out a little bit um, if, if needs be. Um, but before we rush into something and nail it to the wall, we may need to, to think very carefully about how we're going to go about it. And if we have to spend a bit more money, um, so be it. So I'm understanding from the um, from the discussion that what council would like us to do is to um, to get some independent critique of the methodology. Um, and I think you need to do that first before you actually decide then on getting a tender price, because depending on your methodology, whoever you ask to um, tender or um, provide costs, um, they'll need to have apples with apples to compare the costs. So. Um, yeah, so my understanding, if you take it sequentially to achieve both those objectives, we'd need to get an independent review of the methodology. And the second thing then would be to, once we've got an agreed methodology, would be then to make sure that we've got some comparative costings um, that are comparing apples with apples. Does that sound a fair summary of where councillors go? It certainly does. Before we move on to that, though, I think, uh, Councillor West, you had a question as well. It's mine, not really a question, it's a comment. It's, we're about to invest a lot of money into our community. So if we get it right at the, at the beginning, then we don't need to go back and try and repair something that's broken. So I agree with what everyone else has been saying and that we need to make a considered decision based on some really good... Um, based on some really good information. Um, there's not enough for us to go through at the moment. That's just all I have to say. Thank you. So, Councillor Clenzo. Thanks, Mary Alex. Um, my other comment is not on the time frame, but in um, when we're going to talk to the focus groups, there is a um, an allowance in there to pay people to attend these um, these meetings. I think that should be removed totally on the basis that anybody that is going to be involved in this is going to be very interested in what happens to their town and the overall South Wairapa district and will give their time freely and will, will be happy to participate in this. And I do not think that if that we need to offer a payment for those people. Thank you, Councillor Clint. So that, that point is taken. However, I think that is covered under a review of methodology because uh, there's some very structured research done regarding payment versus non-payment. And we'd allow the research professionals, I think, to guide us on that uh, because that does change the outputs of any research. Um, so we just need to tiptoe around that area and, and take expert advice on that. But your point is noted. Um, so uh, in, in conclusion, Harry, I think that is um, uh, possibly where we would like to go is to have a critique and then a costing. How does that fit in with regards to our next council meeting and whether we can um, um, take, uh, shelve this decision until our next council meeting or whether there'd need to be an extraordinary meeting to pass this? Um, I'm actually, I'm just reflecting, because um, a lot of this, what I take apart from um, the discussion about methodology and things is the uncertainty that the COVID situation um, means in terms of where growth could or may go. Um, and what I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking out loud here, Mr. Mayor, is that um, the recovery phase is going to have to develop a number of economic and social um, scenarios about what is actually likely to happen that we need to actually recover to. Um, I'm, and I suspect there's going to be multiple agencies, um, councils, businesses who are going to be working in this space in the next um, couple of months to get a sense of um, what success looks like in terms of recovery, which means there'll be different economic scenarios and different growth scenarios that will be developed in that phase, which actually aligns very well with the um, the very first bullet point about evidence testings and growth scenario development. So uh, long story short, what I'm going to suggest is that we actually put this on the table, not for a month, but we put it on the table, off the table for about um, 
for a quarter while we actually, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, um, so that we get a sense of what it is that people are actually thinking about in terms of growth. So we've got something that we can aim for, because the problem with the, any of these methodologies simply rely on going to uh, actually duplicating a lot of things that people are going to be doing now, which is asking um, what recovery looks like economically, socially, for across the business sector. So there's some real merit in actually waiting and seeing what comes out of that information so we know where we need to put more target, um, targeted consultation as opposed to, you know, think that we're the ones that are going to be replicating this. But I think we are in danger of duplicating a lot of work that's going to be occurring naturally in the next three months. So long story short, what I suggest is we um, that you, you receive this, this report um, and you um, request that it come back in, um, in, in about three months' time. And I'm just putting that figure up because I think that's how long it's going to take to do that work. Um, once we have much more in-depth information based on the, the consultation will occur in the recovery phase. Um, uh, Harry, I take your point as well because we also will need to uh, we'll get more evidence on where money is being spent yeah. by government agencies and what activities from community uh, organisations uh, are occurring. Uh, I, I'm a bit loath to leave it for an entire quarter. Um, I'm worried about what that might do with regards to the, um, um, our, the spatial plan process. Uh, but if you're comfortable that that um, will be uh, still manageable, uh, then, then we could take that or whether it becomes a recurring agenda item which might be shelved if we have had no progress. Uh, Councillor Plimmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. And Harry, I'm, I'm pleased to, you said what you said because that brings it back to what my first question to you was about. Um, but I just would, would like a little bit of clarification in terms of um, taking up from um, Ross's point. Um, a lot of our people in the district may well have a different focus on on their important on what are important issues to them at the moment, and um, we we may well not get a very good response to feedback on this issue when people are more concerned about whether they've got a job tomorrow or how they're putting food on the table. My question though is, if we delay this too far, what's the ongoing impact to this? And and I know we want to get this into line with the the ten year plan. Does it really matter if we don't quite make that? What's what's the implication of that? So the implications, uh, if you have to change, you have to do as part of a long-term plan, an infrastructure plan. Um, so, which is a 30-year look at where you're going to be spending um, your infrastructure, your stormwater, roading, and those types of things. So the growth planning um, that you are doing is also the indication of where you'd be over the 10 year period, you'd be putting your investment um, in terms of infrastructure. So it's a, it would be a bit like, so the, the, the pressing need is to make sure that um, you have a good idea of where growth will be occurring and where it will not, one, to feed into the district plan, um, but secondly, to make sure that you're actually in your long-term planning, planning wisely where you spend infrastructure. And the, the classic example of where it's done badly and why Auckland needs a spatial plan is you imagine pre the formation of um, Auckland Council, there were six councils, all of whom were trying to poach growth um, and infrastructure spend. And so you actually had no coherent view of where spending should go. So that's, the, that's your biggest risk here. But the other um, thing that's going on into the background of this is the regional growth framework. Um, uh, and the regional growth framework, we were hoping to be able to actually feed into that process through the spatial planning thing. But what I was going to suggest, um, as you were talking about nervousness of three months, is why don't we keep this as an active item on the planning and regulatory agenda um, so we can see what this uncertain space is shaping up, what the recovery planning is looking like, where the regional growth planning is looking like, etc., so that we can um, do the work um, to essentially to find out what others are doing and what we can connect um, and we make it a regular item on the planning and regulatory agenda and then um, Council Vickery um, as chair um, and we would be saying to him okay we think we're in a place where we can go now and so that they can then come back to Council but we use the planning and regulatory committee to keep this as an active item um, so that we can make sure that we're 
um, not duplicating what others are doing, but also trying to get it in a timely way. Excellent. Now, uh, Raihania, you have a question. Yeah, thanks. thanks Alex. Yeah, a few things popped up for me during those conversations. Can you hear me? We can't quite hear you. Is that, is that better? Okay, cool. Yeah, a few things popped up for me um, during those conversations. Uh, the first is growth. I'm, I'm a bit, you know, I'm, I'm starting to become more and more concerned with the term growth and that we, we're looking at, we always look at growth as a, in the positive. Um, I think we start, need to start realising that the growth of uh, the humanity um, on the earth is actually detrimental to our ability to sustain, our, sustain ourselves into the future. So when we talk about investing in infrastructure, I want this minuted too, please. Um, our essential infrastructure is nature. And that's where our investments should be. The bulk of our investments should be into nature. And then how do we, and then we need to be thinking, strategizing about how we can connect our people, especially our most vulnerable, with the benefits that nature can provide us. That's how we're gonna live into the future. Um, you know, maybe not the next five, 10 years, but certainly the years to come. And that's what uh, COVID-19 has teach, taught us too. Uh, what's about valuable um, water, food, air, shelter, community. Those are the things that we should be investing into now. So putting the spatial plan on hold for three months, um, I'd say, why don't you try and tap into some of your communities to get them to start brainstorming around how we can actually implement um, some real change through the four, uh, what are the, four well-beings um, and start reimagining a better future, a future where we actually don't crash and burn because of climate change. Um, yeah, you know, I'm really conscious too that our power structures, you know, we, you, all of you guys have been elected and as have I by my community. And I've got no issue with that. Everyone's been elected and we're all in these positions of power. Um, but the system, we don't get to vote on. We don't get a vote on the system. Um, that's just a given. And all of a sudden, these, uh, our, us, our leaders, get move into the system. To me, that is broken, fundamentally broken. We try and move into the system and get it working. It's like a broken down car, throw someone a new driver in it, expecting it to start up and go. Um, so if there's ever been a time for us to reimagine how we do business, we need to be reimagining that right now and strategizing. And the top down power structures of our Western world need to be reevaluated and we need uh, to look at ways to, to be connecting um, the people from the bottom and lifting those voices. That's what democracy essentially is. Everyday people finding their voices and lifting them collectively in such a way that shapes their destinies. If you think about that corridor, you gotta make sure that everyone in your community is actually having a say, not just a vote to get someone in there who don't, you don't really know what they're gonna say about things. Um, so yeah, I think we all need to be thinking long and hard about how we can change the systems that keep um, pushing us to making decisions the way we are. It, so in, for instance, the, there's three of our, um, there's three, we've got three councillors for the Martinborough Award. How are those three councillors connecting with each person in our community? Um, and that's the challenge we've had to, uh, to undertake through this COVID-19 thing. We've had to say, okay, who's in my community and how do I reach out to every single one of them? And that's exactly what we've done. So we've taken their issues to, the, to our table as a South Wairarapa collective and then through to the bigger table called Wairarapa Tene. So looking, looking at our power structures and how just to think about how we elevate those voices from the bottom so we can try and get a bottom up, grassroots up power structure. That's, that's where the richness lies. Thank you. Thank you, Hani. What we're discussing here is the spatial plan. I take on point what you say, however, what we are doing here is providing a structure for engagement and involvement with our community, which then that power comes up to us 
uh, to take into account those decisions in past law. So, uh, I, you know, and also the vehicle for that is through the submissions uh, that are made by the community to the council, which we then take into account. Brian, uh, council so, 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 Alex, no, no, no don't, don't just swap me off like that, Alex. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you think the structures that you're a part of aren't problematic and you're not willing to look at where improvement can be made, then I'm going to suggest to you that you're not you're not going to accede to a level of leadership and moving us in the right direction. I think we need to always be looking at our system and seeing where improvements can be made. And I can tell you right now, you come to my community and ask the people I've been talking to, they'll tell you the council has a lot to improve on. Kia ora. Thank you, Rahania, and I accept that some structures may not be as people desire. However, it is the structure we have, and short of a revolution, uh, we uh, we would have to continue within the structure that we have created or has been um, created for us. Councillor Jepson. Uh, yeah, I'm back on now. You hear me? Yep. Hey, look, I totally agree with Harry. I think that this um, is a bit of a living document and it will change and it'll be big changes coming soon as we get past this COVID issue. And I, uh, I think that should be on the table with the planning and regulatory all the time. That was the reason why the committees were set up. So that we can be nimble, we can change things, we can... I mean, it does need tweaking, we, um, I agree to that. But at the end of the day, this is the second go at the spatial plan. We um, started a couple of three years ago and, and things didn't go according to plan. Um, and we've had a bit of a rethink. So if it was sitting on the table all the time and we were, were feeding into it as the community and, and the ex expectations of the community change, we can actually get a better document out there. So that's all I need to say, yeah. Thank you. So since we're moving along here, um, we have received the document. Um, and if uh, we can have a mover and second, if possibly I'm gonna suggest that we may have a resolution that the spatial plan be kept as an active item on the planning and regulatory committee agenda. And once COVID-19 recovery and growth planning information become available, the committee will make a recommendation to council on preferred methodology. Yep. Uh, are you all like you're okay? So we've moved uh, yep. Councillor Plimmer and seconded. Sorry. Uh, do you want that read back? Anyone want that read back so we can consider that rather than rush this through? Because I'm mindful. No, uh, I understand. Yes, please. I would like it read back because. Okay. Um, so what, my my connection keeps cutting in and out. Oh, there's a, it's working. So we're back to topic. So we they agree that the spatial plan be kept as an active item on the planning and regulatory committee agenda. And once COVID-19 recovery and growth planning information become available, the committee will then make a recommendation to council on preferred methodology. Right, so we've got a mover of uh, Councillor Plimmer, seconder of Council West, I'm about to do a vote, so if you could take yourself off mute. All those in favor, oh, sorry, we'll wait for Pam. And Brian, if you want to take yourself off mute, go lovely. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All, those against, all those against, the motion is carried. So it's uh, now- Mary, uh, Alex, Mary Alex, yeah. could I please be noted to abstain because I couldn't hear any of that. Um, my connection wasn't good enough. Would you like me, to, okay, we'll put you down as abstaining, but I'll send you, uh, you'll see that note, note in the minutes uh, and we can clarify that. If we're gonna, okay, Sorry, let us know, let us know like as well. I'd as well. Can I make a comment? It's Councillor Fox here. Um, Zoom does have the facility to use a comment and chat function. If one of our committee advisors could very quickly type that up, it can be shared on the comments section of Zoom. And for those people that have missed that, uh, they'll be able to read it and then potentially we could vote on it. Would that be helpful for people? Um, yeah, Suzanne, what's the legality of that with regards to having had a vote that 
possibly we were unaware some people were able to respond to. Why don't we just do that again? I have just sent it on chat to everybody. So we are able to change a resolution in the meeting where it's made with no problems at all. So Thank why you. don't we just review that? Okay, so if everyone could then review the right the uh, uh, what Suzanne has typed out for us kindly, thank you, and then we'll redo a vote on that. So the motion has been moved and seconded already. If you want to take yourselves off mute for the vote. And I'll also add an abstaining um, uh, part to that vote. So, okay, Councillor Fox, Councillor Vickery, if you take yourself off mute. So, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 All aye. those against. All those against. All those abstaining. Councillor Fox. Sorry, Councillor West. <laughs> the, motion, the motion is carried. Um, um, so just a point of clarification there. Um, Councillor West actually seconded the motion. No, I didn't. I wanted oh, to actually oh. say a comment. Oh, did you? Yes. Well, let's... I think we might do this again. <laughs> <laughs> the, joy, the joys of... of um, the joys of... of uh, Zoom. Okay. So and then I, my, my comment was around to what um, Ruben was saying and that I acknowledge and I hear what you say and that um, perhaps through the regulatory committee, that would be the forum to bring up the community issues. Or totally. The, We're the, allowing a lot that wasn't more clarified, that, Yeah, that wasn't yeah. clarified um, during the discussion. So yeah. maybe that just puts a little bit okay. of framework around it. So I'm now going to, on the third time, and uh, this is all cool, this is all part of learning. Uh, so I would like to mo uh, move that the spatial plan be kept as an active item on the planning and regulatory committee agenda. And once the COVID-19 recovery and growth planning information becomes available, the committee will make a recommendation to us, the council, on preferred methodology. So we had a mover of Councillor Plimmer, you still okay with that? Yep. And a seconder of Councillor Fox. Yep. Right. Uh, okay. Um, mute off. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against. All those abstaining. The motion is carried. Right. So it's now 11-11. Um, and I'd like to go into, um, I've had to have a break for 10 minutes, so we'll reconvene at 11.21. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Hey guys, we can get back into um, and start the meeting again at 11.23. Uh, right, so moving on to the, we won't be moving on to the next agenda item. Uh, uh, item B2, liquefaction prone land. Um, there's been a request to have that um, pulled. Um, Harry, would you like to comment on that? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, the process that was suggested here um, required or suggested a structural engineer. We're just checking um, with IPENS whether um, that is actually a suitably qualified person to do that in the interim. Um, so before we have that information, um, well, we need that information before we can make this recommendation to you. So um, we're going to withdraw the report until we've got that information. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. So that then uh, moves immediately on to uh, B3. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Councillor uh, Hay first. Oh, no, sorry. It was JP was wanting to talk. Oh, OK. Yeah. Councillor Jepson. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was going to suggest that this goes on to the uh, planning and regulatory um, committee's desk because, um, as as be, I said before, this is what these committees were set up for, to dive down into the detail of it. And it, it's uh, going to be a living document again. And then let them make the recommendations to put the full council. I mean... It is a bit of a reset can, when you looked at the paper as to what came out of it and 
uh, particularly with the information that you got, Alex, uh, through a, a different light on to it. My fear was if we went in this, into this um, without digging into it, it was going to be a bit like the Waihini floodplain where they created a group in Greytown and they challenged the regional council and found out uh, their desktop analysis was completely wrong. And I'm, that's my fear with this. So my suggestion <coughs> is that it goes on to the planning and regulatory uh, desk. Uh, yeah, and that's the way it should go. So we'll, um, from here, um, this, we'll pull the report and then we'll be um, resubmitting it via the planning and regulatory committee. Um, as well, is there oversight as well within the risk, uh, finance and risk committee with regards to this being similar to Leaky Homes, a risk, um, having a risk impact for council? Uh, I, I agree with that, Alex. Um, yeah. Particularly if you look at um, historically Leaky Homes and, you know, the billions that's been spent by councils in that space. So, um, but that could be something we work in tandem with the planning and regulatory committee, I would have thought, if you were yeah. happy with that, GP. <clears throat> yeah, more than happy, more than happy. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Councillor Plimmer? Yeah, I, I agree with GP entirely. That's, uh, it needs to go to the committee for really in depth. I think one of the things, Harry, that's missing in here is any any uh, financial implications in terms of what it's got. Uh, whatever the outcome may be, well, what are some of the costings that might impact upon the community or what it might impact upon council and so on. So there's, there's a lot more that needs to go into this yet. Right, sure. Councillor Colenso. Um, thank you, Mayor Alex. Um, I would also like to endorse that it goes through the um, um, assets and finances and the planning and regulatory but I'd also like to see, like the Waihini Action Group, that um, members of our community that actually know the areas um, and have an understanding of the soil contents and things like that are used in, um, in compiling these reports as well, because uh, I think um, the Waihini Action Group um, certainly emphasize the fact that local knowledge went a long way as well as the um, the specialists in those areas. So I, what I think we can do is then when they get to those committees we can raise those issues and make sure that um, they're taken into account in any um, report from the officers if we're if we're comfortable with that. Yep. Right, so uh, we'll then move along to um, I, unless there's any other further comment but I think we've we've done that. Um, to item B3, the listing of the Kaki Observatory as a heritage building, uh, which is report B3. Uh, do we have a mover to receive the report? Thank you, Councillor Ems. A seconder, Councillor Colenso. Thank you very much. I'm now going to put a vote, so if you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> okay, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 against, abstaining, the motion is carried. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson, do you have any comments on the report? I'm sure you do. Have we lost? Harry? No, there he is. Uh, you're on mute, Harry. Oh, Unmuted now. Um, so in terms of um, the report itself, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the um, legal requirements um, for getting this as a schedule. Um, the main issue that we have is what the costs um, would be in terms of actually implementing this if it occurred. So the recommendations here are that you support in principle the listing of the observatory um, and you also delegate to me the authority to make the submission. Um, we need to inform the public about the process so that other people um, take the opportunity to um, submit. But also we need to take undertake further investigation, including the costings and what it would actually um, be required to conserve. Note that they, in the report, there's no intention to that the property, it is literally just maintaining the property. Um, it isn't, but it does require access, public access, um, but there's no intention to actually um, upgrade it or restore the building to its um, its previous state. That could be done by a replica. Uh, sorry, Councillor um, West. Oh, 
I think something's become unplugged. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> we'll get you. We'll, we'll come to Councillor. Oh, are you okay now? I hope so. Um, do we know how much additional cost this is for the council to um, maintain the building? No, we don't. Um, that's why we've got that recommendation or suggestion we undertake further investigation, including the costings, to conserve it. Uh, any other councillors have um, any questions? Uh, Councillor Hay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Um, I was involved in the restoration of the Donald Bruce woolshed at Cobblestones and uh, and also all of the buildings there, the heritage buildings, have had to have uh, architectural conservation plans. So I can tell you, Harry, the cost um, involved with those, and that's uh, between ten and twenty thousand dollars per unit for a conservation uh, architectural plan. Um, furthermore, the wool shed was not as uh, as a bad a state, but that restoration costs ninety thousand for the wool shed. Um, in addition, it's Heritage New Zealand have very very limited funding, so my uh, suggestion for this would be to set it up as a trust, a community trust of some sort, and uh, that way, as long as their charity status, GST registered, etc., they can apply for funding for Lotto under the Heritage uh, Guidelines. Um, but in, in this current uh, state we're in, I think it would be very difficult to get funding from the community. Uh, it, it will come at a cost to council, most definitely, um, and I would be, uh, be very surprised if we were able to come up with a $20,000 for a conservation plan. And Heritage New Zealand always insists that that be done. So I'd just be very, very mindful of the costs and the, and the additional costs of access, et cetera. But if you, if Harry, if you would like any further information, it's at the fingertips of, um, well, my scythe, but John Gilbert thought would be very well placed to advise you or give you a broad brush overview. So happy to connect the appropriate person with John. That would be fantastic. That would help. Be yeah. good. Councillor Maynard. Um, yes, my, my, under, my understanding is when you're when when you, you're placing something into um, um, uh, 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 into into this frame, um, that that uh, the ma maintaining of it and things is to keep it. Uh, um, you, you need you need to kind of have to still keep it looking. Not not exactly how it is now, but but in that in the way that it was historically, as um, with that upkeep as well. And I'm not 100 percent sure if that sits with the council. So um, no, sorry, council member. The, um, if you see an under rehabilitation paragraph 3.3, um, 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 the historic places trust or whatever that HNZ. It's be stabilised as a ruin and archaeological site. So there is no requirement to reinstate it to anything other than the present state. It's simply just to hold it, hold the line as it is. Okay. Thank you, Harry. Councillor Ems and then Councillor Colenso. Sorry. <clears throat> Can I just say I'm I'm really excited about this. It came forward as a result of the submissions made for the Featherston Wastewater. We were advised then that there are no archaeological heritage or Waitaku sites in that area and they've been sitting there since 1870. The community is actually seeing this as a very strong driver for tourism. Uh, it links in directly with Dark Sky uh, there is considerable support from the community. I've been talking to people who've been involved with the Catherine Mansfield restoration and places like that. Um, my group, uh, who were submitters, um, felt very uh, upset when we were told that this place was not listed. It's taken us the best part of five years to get to where we are now. Yes, I take the point it will cost some money, 
but I think we should go back to the community and say, look, these are the benefits. We're going to have a, a, a thing here that's been going since 1870. My connections and my contacts at the Maori Standing Committee also supported this because there was obviously a very strong connection between the Kakik family and uh, what's going on and the, the, uh, his wife. And they're obviously, as we know, they're buried on the Kapiti Coast. Um, I think this is a great step forward and I'm really pleased to be part of this council voting on this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Colenso. Um, I think I would support the, um, the, the going ahead with this. The, the piece that I'm concerned about right at the moment that um, this will be obviously be included in our significant buildings for the South Wairapa um, now because we understand the heritage behind that. Um, the, my, two of my concerns are that the piece of land that it's on, we're not reading the heritage report and everything, we're not going to do anything with what the piece is at the moment or what is left of, of the observatory at the moment. But what we are looking at, what they are looking at doing is building a replica of that next door to it so that people can can see what 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 the building actually would have looked like if it had been retained. Um, firstly, have I got that right? And secondly, um, the council delegates to the chief executive of the authority to make the submission to Heritage New Zealand. Does that submission um, commit us To, does that um, submission commit us to a financial contribution? And if so, then I would oppose that authority until I know what the financial um, content of that is going to be. Thank you. Uh, Her uh, Mr. Wilson, if you could comment on that particular question. So the first part of that question about a replica, there's only there's only a suggestion here that that is one one thing that could be done. It is not a there is not a given that there would be a replica constructed. So under paragraph three point three, the report makes that clear that there is potential for a replica observatory built elsewhere, which is part of the reason why it can simply be um, stabilised as a ruin and archaeological site. So it's not a given that a replica be constructed. Um, the nature of, yes, um, if we do make a submission, obviously it is a submission, and so ultimately there's a decision that has to be made. Um, if the decision is made regardless of our submission, it could still land us in a situation of having to incur costs. So if this is labelled as a, um, as a, um, as a um, historic site, then um, we will have costs regardless of whether we submit or not, if the decision is made that way. Um, the, if you look at the financial implications part of the report, um, the costs that we, we envisage will be resource consent applications, preparing a conservation plan, um, rehabilitation and providing public access. What we would do is look for co cooperation with interested parties like Diet Skies, Heritage New Zealand, um, through the Heritage Preservation Incentive Fund, Walking Tower Groups, see what we can do to actually get fundraising to actually offset some of those costs. And we think, as Councillor Ems has noted, there's strong community interest in supporting with this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Harry. Uh, if I could also make a comment, um, I was aware of this uh, when we were going through uh, Heritage for the um, War Memorial um, building in Featherston, and this was raised. Um, there were two ways about getting this made a heritage building. One is as the landowner, which the council is, that we could have just said, yes, we agree, and, they, and then Heritage New Zealand would not have gone through this consultation process. However, that did not fit in with any council meetings to raise this. So they moved on to a consultation process. The second is that this is probably a fait accompli, uh, that I, 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 even if we submitted violently against it, I think this would continue as being classified a, a heritage building. 
uh, in which case any costs would, that would be occurred, um, incurred were well, still going to be borne by the council. So I, I, it's, it's the fact, I don't think we should, even though it may end up costing us something, to have a heritage building like this within our, our district is something that many other districts would kill for, uh, especially with the, with, with the work we're doing within Dark Skies, Councillor Ian's Councillor has alluded to. So uh, we, we, could, we could discuss uh, obligations uh, to the nth degree. The reality is, I think, that at some stage in the very near future, in the future, this will become a heritage listed building and we will have obligations anyway. Um, so that, that's the other option is if we agree with the um, uh, that the heritage build a heritage New Zealand that it should be a heritage site, we could circumvent or, or mean that they don't need to undertake the consultation with the public uh, and incur those costs, in which case they may be more amenable to funding some of the, um, the restoration plans or heritage plans uh, that are required. So that's another option. I'm not sure, Suzanne, how we would sit legally uh, doing that here or interrupting the consultation process. Um, yeah, if you have a comment on that, possibly. Uh, actually, I'd like uh, Mr. Wilson to answer that, Hi. please. Um, um, we could ask that question, um, but I think once the, um, the Heritage New Zealand have decided to go down this track, yeah. Um, then they are committed to going down that track. I think it has already been publicly notified. Um, so I don't think there's much option but to continue um, to respond within the process that, um, that Heritage New Zealand have um, undertaken. Uh, uh, Councillor Plimmer, I think, was it? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just, I'm just looking at the um, photograph of it, and I completely agree with what um, Garrick said, and I support it entirely. I think it dovetails nicely into, into tourism for the district. Um, I'm just looking at the photograph, it seems to be in a paddock, um, and I can't see in any of the reports who owns the land. And when we talk about access to the site, does that mean we're going to be taking over some private ownership of land or something and saying to a farmer or whatever, people are going to come through your paddocks? So what's the process? Um, okay, uh, uh, Alistair, I can probably answer that, Harry, or you can, but we own the land? We own the land. Uh, we, and we have also fenced it off and we maintain the grass around it at the moment. Um, um, but a, a, apart from that, um, uh, it's, it's, it's just being held in a, in, a, in, a, in a state of disrepair, I suppose. If I could what, about, what about access to the, to, I can see it's fenced off. What about access actually to it? I can't see any road or anything nearby. There is um, no. Um, so if listed, the public um, would, be, would need to be provided with access to the site. Um, so it is on a um, contemplated walking and cycling trail. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that we dovetail in with the walking and cycling initiatives that are going on through there. Um, yes, but so public access would be a cost um, to actually do it. Councillor West. I can't read it this time. Um, given the fact that that information has just come to light and it wasn't contained within the report, um, how does it, how's that now reflected? Because we've discussed it, but it's not actually written down anywhere. And I think that's what Alistair was alluding to. Um, Harry, um, are you able to help us out with that one? So the, the bit about public access is mentioned in the report. Um, there's a there's a paragraph 3.4 um, that mentions um, the public access and what we would need to do to open that. Um, and the ownership? I'd need to read the report in detail, but I'd be very surprised if that wasn't mentioned somewhere in the report. Um, that's that's why I asked the question. I couldn't find yeah. anything about ownership. Okay, um, well, I do apologise for that. Um, it, it is definitely in the report that um, the district council owns the the land because um, it transferred from the Hodder farm, uh, the Hodder family to um, South Wairarapa district council, and it also mentions the previous owners before the Hodders. So uh, yeah, there is quite a paragraph in there about the ownership of it. Thank you, Councillor Colenso. Councillor Ems again. 
I was just going to I was just going to say that it's, it's access. The access would be down a paper road, which has already been fenced off, and it runs down from um, lo uh, Longwood West. Um, and you just go down there. It would be a requirement just to put the uh, cycle trail through. But once again, this is another part of my comment about a, a tourism access there, because the uh, the cycle trail would be going down there and past the Kakik, and then can take a a, um, a turn and go into Cross Creek. So it links in nicely with a number of tourism activities. And yes, that is a paper road already formed. Thank you. Um, could we just call on, I just had a wee note there. Karen, uh, do you have some comments um, regarding this that you'd like to make? Uh, kia ora tato. Um, yes, uh, just uh, apologies for the delay in getting the report to you. Um, uh, Godwell or Russell can uh, similarly pitch in um, with uh, any further clarification around uh, around this. But yes, the council does own the, the land. It was part of the Hodder Farm, and so the observatory came came with the land. Um, and the, the the recommendations before you in the report are really around um, making a submission through the consultation process for um, Heritage New Zealand. They have kindly agreed to extend their consultation process. As, as the Mayor um, pointed out, um, we were contacted initially um, as owners, landowners, uh, and we could have given uh, our consent there and the issue would not have gone out to public consultation. Um, we, we didn't have time to fit in with the uh, the public meeting session, but our view also was that uh, consultation would have been important. So whether it would have been consultation carried out by Heritage New Zealand or consultation carried out by ourselves, um, as, as there has been discussion, it's quite an important uh, building and we felt that um, possibly that, that would have been needed to be a, a little bit more of an extensive conversation that we had. As we are, we have moved into the uh, the consultation period, um, and so the question for councillors is: with, Do they want to make a submission through that process? Uh, officers thought that it was uh, appropriate for council to have that choice to do so, um, so that uh, so the ratepayers were aware of where council's position uh, was on whether we support the listing. So the listing will continue and go ahead uh, and that will depend on obviously the, the public uh, response and our response to, to that. So we're not in control of that process, but that will be for Heritage New Zealand to decide. Um, and then what will need to happen is uh, we will need as a council to, uh, to discuss with Heritage New Zealand um, where to from, from here. And that's the, the conversation that we have to have around uh, how, it, uh, how the building is conserved. Um, and it is, just, it is being stabilised and it's an archaeological site. It's not about restoring the, the observatory to, uh, to its full glory. I think we all recognise that we're probably past that point. But um, the report um, from Heritage New Zealand does recognise that there are alternatives there. So we would need to have a look at uh, a conservation plan. Um, they could be quite different... Um, to the other work, I appreciate Councillor Hay's uh, input into the cost of conservation plans, and Godwell perhaps can, uh, can fill us in a bit more information there. But I think we were looking at um, a conservation for pain, a conservation plan for Payne Farm around sort of eight to ten thousand dollars, and that was um, because, of course, it's you know we would be looking at bringing it up to its full glory. Um, so this isn't quite that in, in, in that vein. It's more of a sort of I, I imagine an, an engineering an archaeological response. Um, so we'd have to go away and got costings on that. Um, so, um, so, so that's part of the work there. There's also the discussion about whether it is then included within the district plan. Um, it, so the listing is a historic place uh, and then as part of the district plan review we would consider of, uh, including that as one of our scheduled buildings within uh, the, the district plan. Uh, and so a lot of more work has to happen there. So um, so long story basically was to just to outline to you the, the request for you today is that do we support this being listed as a historic place? Um, and if we do, um, then uh, making a submission to, uh, to, to that effect and giving uh, the chief executive the delegated authority to make that submission on council's behalf. And then count, uh, officers will go away and look at costings and what work needs to happen or that we recommend should happen to be able to utilise the building uh, uh, and um, and have access to it because if it is, we think it is important that the um, the community does have access to it and that would be perhaps linking in with that um, with that trail um, and the paper road and these are all possibilities to discuss. Any questions? Right, uh, Councillor Maynard. 
Um, Karen and 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 Harry, uh, I'm just I'm just curious as to why, if it's coming from the council, why it wouldn't go through the mayor, and why it's seen that 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 the um, uh, submission should be. I mean, I, I it would be. I'm sure you've both been working collaboratively <laughs> anyway, um, both both Mayor Alex and Harry. And but I'm just a little bit confused if there was something that was coming from from council and from governance, why uh, you know to to sign off on why why Mayor Alex wouldn't be that person that's submitting it. I can respond to that, uh, Councillor. Um, the, the, the council is effectively the landowner, and that, that is all of the council. Um, and so uh, it's appropriate there for if you, um, it, council to make that decision as landowner uh, and to respond, I think, through, through submission, through the, you know, the, through the legislative process, it would be appropriate that council did that, or if council felt that um, that would be something that, the, that they wanted the mayor to do, uh, then delegate the authority to the mayor to do that or to the CE. Yeah, and yeah, Councillor May. Yeah, we haven't uh, discussed. I haven't discussed. I haven't discussed this with um, with Harry, uh, and uh, but we can certainly play with the um, uh, the resolution uh, if if you feel that you'd prefer to see that um, uh, submission prior to it being sent by by um, Mr. Wilson. Uh, so, Councillor Plummer, you had a question. No, I just uh, just want to uh, apologise to Council. I have since found the um, part in the document where it says who owns it on page 44 of 58. So, um, so I do hope you're right, Pam. Sorry. Um, but I would have thought it would have been in the body of the document as opposed to a record of title actually talking about who owns it and so on. But... Well, do we have any other questions? Oh, sorry, Councillor Vickery. Thank you, Worship. Um, it, it seems to me it's, it's quite a simple just, um question to be answered here is whether the council wishes to make a submission in support of, of the listing this, uh, this site. And I'd like to note and endorse what uh, Councillor M said. The historic significance of this is immense. Um, and it's entirely consistent. Its preservation is entirely consistent with a lot of the aims we have and values we wish to promote in our area. Um, dark sky, cycle and tourist trails, uh, responsible landowning. Um, I, I, I think it's inconceivable that we would either not submit or submit against it. I know there will be costs, but there will be costs whatever happens. So uh, I just again like to endorse um, Councillor M's position on that. Thank you, Councillor Hay. Hi there. Um, look, I'd just like to endorse what you said as well, Ross and Derek, and I'm fully supportive, but I just wanted to raise the issues of potential costs, but I in no way oppose this. I think that we, these are very precious treasures in our district and we need to uh, conserve them. And I, I totally agree. I would wholeheartedly give my support to this submission. Thank you. Councillor Jepson. Um, Sorry, and then Councillor Colenso. Sorry about that. Okay, look, to me, this is a no-brainer. We have to support it. It's, it's what we're trying to establish in this district with uh, and Garrick and Ross and even Lee have said it. You know, we, we've got the dark sky. It goes hand-in-hand hand with that. It goes hand-in-hand hand with most tourism and attractions to the district. So I fully support it. I too, I too support the um, the what what is trying to be done here, and um, and I recognise the um, the potential for for Featherston having having this um, this observatory recognised and and be putting on the map. I also recognise the um, the significance to the Dark Sky Society. Um, my two comments are that um, when the submission is, or before the submission is sent to um, Heritage uh, New Zealand, that um, that comes out to councillors to see that before it is signed off and sent. And I don't mind whether that's a joint submission. Um, or actually, I would prefer it being a joint submission from the Mayor and the CEO. 
And secondly, I would like to see that those costings, um, as, as they are known, whether that be piecemeal or all in one, that those are fed through to the council on a continuation basis as they arise and um, as things have to be done on, on the property to, to allow any public access or whatever going into the future that that continues to come through. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, uh, councillors, have we um, any other questions or clarification, clarification required prior to me moving? I'm going to su uh, suggest that we, uh, uh, Suzanne, if we could change, if you if the councillors are happy, that we cha change uh, item three to the council delegates to the chief executive and the mayor, the authority to make the submission to the Heritage New Zealand subject to councillors' comment on said submission. Does this satisfy everyone's um, process? Cool. All right, so uh, if that's the end of the questions, we'll go down to, uh, to moving it, and I'll uh, move all uh, four at once, and I'll read them. Um, the we're proposing the council supports in principle the listing of the Kaki Observatory by Heritage New Zealand through Heritage New Zealand's public consultation process, that the council delegates to the chief executive and the mayor the authority to make a submission to Heritage New Zealand subject to councillors' comment on said submission, that the council sub informs the public about the Heritage New Zealand process and council support for the listing, and finally that the council undertakes further investigation, including costings, to conserve Kaki Observatory as recommended by Heritage New Zealand. Do we have a mover for those? Yeah. Councillor Holmes. Mm -hmm. Seconded, Councillor Vickery. Okay, we're now going to ask on a vote on this, so if you could unmute yourself. Right. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, abstaining, the motion is carried. Thank you, guys. That was, that was a good, good, robust um, discussion. Right, now on to item B4, which is rates and other relief in response to COVID-19. So we're now considering report B4. Do we have a mover to receive the report? Councillor Hay, a seconder, Councillor Fox. I'm now going to ask for a vote. Could you unmute yourselves? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All, that, aye. Sorry, aye. all those against, the motion is carried. Okay, so this is an information report only, and we're not being asked to make a decision. Uh, but I do encourage robust discussion and debate on this one because it's quite important. Uh, Mr. Wilson, do you have comment on the report as received? Uh, we recognise the difficulty that um, the COVID-19 situation will place on a number of households. Um, so we've had a look at some of the options um, that we can um, implement or do. In essence, the, the report recommends um, that we do this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is that if you change your policy, and if you change your policy to allow hardship to occur or to make a blanket decision, you'll need to change your policy, which requires consultation. Um, the consultation will take um, time, obviously, and we want to be able to tell our ratepayers that we can do things now. Secondly, um, there are a number of things that we can do. Um, they do require, with the, uh, sorry, they're case-by-case -case matters. Um, there are also a number of things that we can do that aren't related to rates itself, which are mentioned in the report. So, for instance, the ability to pay our suppliers promptly on a weekly basis rather than waiting to the end of the month. Um, another option that you have to consider, and um, and that will occur during deliberations as it where you set things like consent and subdivision fees or those types of things. Because um, I'm sure there are a number, be a number of parties who will be um, wanting to um, no longer go ahead with a subdivision or a consent. Um, and we need to think about how we deal with those. But again, 
part of the, um, the recommendation here is you think about this as a case by case basis, um, rather than trying to make a, a blanket decision about a policy. Um, you will notice in the report that we've also looked at what a number of other government um, or what another local um, authorities are doing. In fact, um, most of them are doing the same kind of things that we're proposing to you here. So with that in mind, we look forward to your discussion and um, what options you think are, are useful for Council to explore further. Thank you, uh, Mr Wilson. Uh, before we start, about, and, and uh, Councillor Maynard, I've got you down for number one. Um, the first one is, what is our capability in Council to change policy to allow easing of the criteria, or does that require it? That's required. Mr. Wilson. Karen, Karen, would you like to answer that? <clears throat> yes, mean. Or Katrina? Sorry, sorry, Alex, can you just repeat that question for me? Certainly. We have a number of policies regarding mm -hmm. deferred payments and um, uh, what was the other one there? Sorry, excuse me. Um, rates, postponement. Rates, yeah. postponement. Um, how easy is that for us to change those, or are we looking to change those? Uh, in order to allow a more proactive or lenient stance? So, to change them, we need that the, these policies are all reviewed as part of the long term plan every time we review the long term plan. Um, to change the policies um, now would require us to go out to public consultation. That would be, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be a long consultation process or a costly one, but it would require us to engage with our community um, and ask them um, that before we could um, change it. Um, so that, that, that's where there is a little bit of a difficulty. We, we have identified in the report that there are some areas that um, we think um, need to be tightened up on, definitions, um, et cetera, that um, we can do as part of the long-term plan when we do um, review them. Um, yeah, does that answer your question, Mia Mina? Um, yeah, yeah, kind of. It's just uh, how does that impact on our flexibility now or with our next rates demand coming out uh, in the ability to be um, possibly more lenient with people who are in, um, in that, or do you think there's enough capability within, within the current policy to achieve an aim of being more um, uh, relaxed on, <coughs> on needs? So, oh. if I can answer that. So, um on a case-by-case -case basis, your policy allows us to do that. Um, so the, um, it requires people to demonstrate hardship um, and enter into a payment plan or um, whatever option um, they can do, but your policies allow those. What I was referring to and Katrina was referring to is, for instance, if you wanted to put in place a blanket um, policy, that would be significant and require consultation. Thank you, that's clarified for me, thank you. Uh, Councillor Maynard. So um, your, your meaning such as, um, I'm just wondering how um, Masterton Council was able to waive late payment penalties for the next two quarters sure. um, um, without doing that. So if I could answer that, um, they have not been able to do that as yet. Um, they, that is a, uh, something they're proposing. They have not actually put that in place and they haven't gone through the consultation process to do that. In fact, they are the only council that um, has adopted that throughout New Zealand. So, so they would be they would be looking at going through that consultation process to be able to to put that in place. That's correct. Um, thank you. Um, is that something we want, uh, Brian? I've got you next, but uh, Harry, is that something we should be looking at, or would you recommend against that? I'm I'm recommending against it. I, I think the the basic thing here is to be able to respond on a case by case basis to an individual situation where there is hardship um, and risk. So the, um, which is an entirely reasonable thing to do. Um, you're, you're, otherwise you're in danger of setting, by doing a blanket situation, you're allowing people who can afford to pay um, to actually affect your council revenues. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jepson, then Councillor uh, yeah, Fox, then Councillor Vickery. I uh, totally agree with Harry. Uh, we have to collect our rates to survive and do the services we need. If we don't do it on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, there'll be people that default. It might take a long, long time 
to get that rates back into our bank. Um, and if you do it on occasion, every situation is different. And, you know, um, hell, if they can drip feed us, it doesn't have to, at least we can be assured that we're going to get the, the rates. So, you know, I, what Harry said just rings true with me that, you know, everyone's different and we have to take that on board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fox, and then Vickery, then Maynard. Thank you, Mayor Bain. Um, I, and no one can really say they enjoy reading a document like this because of the circumstances we're all in. But what I would say of this document is it seems to cover most scenarios. And if we work on a case-by-case -case basis, it means that we can be really nimble, notwithstanding the fact that people's situation actually might be all right today, but it may not be all right in six months' time. And it could still be as a consequence of, um, of response to this pandemic. And the thing that concerns me is if we were to make a blanket change, firstly, the consultation will take too long, um, and secondly, um, it, it does allow a whole pile of other things, which I don't think we want to see. Fundamentally, people that can afford to pay their rates probably will. Um, but seeing that we can include some flexibility in this for people is great. And I, I very much support um, the proposal to pay some of our smaller supplies, and it might be our medium supplies as well, um, on a more regular basis, because cash flow is going to be one of the things that keeps those businesses um, Solvent, and if we can do that, then it means we're keeping keeping our region um, productive. So I support that. So it's a, a really good proposal. Thank you. Before we go to Councillor Vickery, I think uh, Harry, could you comment? But I think we started paying our suppliers uh, on a weekly basis very on in COVID uh, level four. Did we not? Yes, that's what we've been doing. Yeah, so I think we were probably one of the more proactive councillors and councils in that area. Uh, Councillor Vickery. Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, now, um, thank you for this paper, uh, Harry, and, and, and all of your staff. There's a lot of work gone into this at short notice. I, I do appreciate it. Um, and I, I support your case-by-case -case basis approach, but I'd just like to note that I wouldn't want to dismiss out of hand any of the other options Things such as rates postponement could be a valuable tool uh, in, the, in, the, in the fiscal box uh, in due course. Um, similarly, uh, late payment uh, rem fee remissions, I wouldn't want to see that off the table either. But my, my experience of revenue collection is that we should adopt an approach similar to that sanctioned by Section 6A of the Tax Administration Act to collect the highest net revenue permissible within the law over time, bearing in mind the cost of collection and hardship affecting those uh, suffering the impost. So if we are to, to adopt initially a case-by-case -case basis, and uh, I think that's a good idea, how are we going to administer that and what qualifications for remission will we be, look, we be looking at? So Katrina could answer that in more detail, but answering the latter, it, a person would have to prove a case of hardship, um, though noting that we don't actually have a definition of what hardship actually means. Um, so we will apply that pragmatically, and what our intention would be then to redefine what hardship actually means and bring that back through the LTP um, review. So it, it's a pragmatic case. To give you some confidence in that, um, Council has been um, remitting and or managing debt, um, which you'll have seen regularly reported through our finance mm -hmm. audit and risk. We have one of the lowest number of, we can count on one hand, the number of people that actually owe council money for rates, simply because we, um, and I take my hat off to Katrina and her team, um, they manage very sensitively these situations and encourage people to um, work out payment plans that actually work for them. And it's been very successful. So this isn't, in that sense, this is something that isn't new to us. We have been successful, we have been applying it, and we've been doing it very effectively. And um, Katrina, do you have comment on the first part of that? Yeah, look, I think, um, as Harry mentioned, we have been really proactive um, and um, open to people contacting us and um, 
uh, putting them on payment plans and direct debits. We've got something like a 38, 39% uptake of direct debits at the moment. Um, not to say that some of those people won't default, I'm not saying that at all, but, but we've got, we've instilled that in our ratepayers that, um, that confidence that they can just call us and say, hey, I can't afford this direct debit this week, can we delay it? But also the ability to be able to go on a payment plan. I guess that is the best tool that we've got in our tool whip box at the moment with our policies um, is the payment plan option um, it allows people up to um, at least 12 months to get their rates back up to date so for example if you've got a rate payer that may be in difficulty through COVID um, and literally can't pay the rates for the next couple of months then or the next installment then we've got the ability within the payment plan to be able to um, to accommodate that uh, as long as we try and get them to get their rates up to date within 12 months. Um, so the team, in terms of the number of people, because our overdues and our arrears are so low at the moment, we feel that we have the capacity within our rates team at the moment to be able to deal with any, um, any influx in people that, um, that come to light. To, um, just to note, that we have been very um, mindful and I've been checking in on our rates officer with how many, whether we've got many people coming through and um, we have got more people coming onto direct debit, um, not a massive amount, but at the moment, kirsty has been seeing an increase in that and also a couple more people going onto payment plans. So we are seeing a little bit more increase in that area, but that's also a positive thing because it means that people are um, contacting us. So. We do have the capacity to be able to deal with um, this on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm confident of that. Does that answer that? Fantastic, uh, Judy. You actually answered one of my questions there accidentally. As well. um, if we could go to Councillor Maynard, had some a question. Yeah, um, um, thank you so much, Katrina. Because that, you know, I guess we all we all know that that rates are considered quite a large expenditure in, in many of our districts' households. So. You know, this is actually one of their big ones, if you like. Mm -hmm. So, so it's really, it's it's good to hear that there are already these things in place. And I, I know what a great job you guys have done in, in bringing that um, that debt down as well. So, so it's nice also to hear that, that the capabilities are there already in council um, and in place. Um, something else that I'd like to to note as well is that um, in having a look at what other councils are doing, a lot of them are doing things like making libraries free um, and, yeah. and, and things like that that we've that actually as a council we did prior to this anyway yeah. so we're, we're kind of tracking and have already put things in place that um, a lot of a lot of other councils are now looking at doing um, so so believe me I, I, I guess it's um it's more. It's more just wanting to know that, um, that and you also answer the questions that I had about the suppliers and the fact that it, um, they're being paid weekly now is, is really good to hear as well. So all of these things I think really need to be raised because because they're they're good to know. And I think with rates relief, people aren't aware of the things that uh, South Water Upper District Council has already put in place. Great. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. If I could also make some comment, and uh, the question you answered for me, Katrina, was regarding capability within council to handle this. The other two questions I have is the ability for consistency amongst all the applications and whether or not we're going to have one single person handling these that can consistently apply the criteria that are established. And also, this is a very public, publicly sensitive area and we want to be visible that we're being uh, that we're doing this and without disclosing numbers or, or or actual people but we do it'd be nice to have and I, Amy might be able to comment on how we can go out and say we have done this and and uh, and we are being more proactive or more lenient for those truly in need than we have previously uh, I don't know if, if you could make comment on those two Katrina um, yeah, certainly the first one. Um, at the moment, uh, to go onto a payment plan, um, that would be signed off by the CFO. However, there's no reason why we, that couldn't be a joint decision and um, be passed through the CEO as well. Um, I'd be more than happy for that to, um, to occur. Um, we are keeping um, 
I have asked my rates officer to keep track of um, calls that come in um, um, so that we can keep an eye on how many people are actually calling us about this, how many people are going on payment plans, how many extra people are going on direct debit. So we are keeping a bit of a track on that as well, just for future reference, so we can go back and refer, um, refer to that. Um, I don't know whether Amy can comment further on your other um, question, Amy. I'm not sure whether she's here. Um, yeah, I, uh, Amy, I did actually forward uh, to Amy uh, something that was put out by the Masterton District Council saying here's what we're doing, you know, in a bullet point thing, which yeah. of which probably half of them we were already doing anyway. Yeah, uh, but yeah. whether or not we can um, uh, have some bullet point uh, saying that we're not sitting around but we are reacting. I've got that conversation, yes. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, Councillor Plimmer, I think you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I, I completely support all the comments that have been made here. Um, I, I certainly don't believe that blanket um, blanket relief works. Um, in fact, it sends a very bad signal across the community. Um, and case by case is, is really important because everybody's circumstances are different, as everybody said. Um, one of the things I would like to see perhaps um, within our policy is a little bit of guidance to provide some of that um, way of interpreting things consistently across the board. So maybe, maybe Katrina, you could give some thought as to guidance that, that we could see this is the, these are the criteria in which we assess rates relief under, uh, maybe to provide some of that consistency, particularly in this, you know, we're gonna get a lot of requests I would imagine coming through. Um, and I think it's also important that the public notification of this policy is really important. So I'm pleased that that's come up as well. Um, and the other, the other area that I really wanna talk about is the, the payment schedule, Harry, that you have for paying people's bills. Um, the 20th of the month following invoice, from my understanding, was put into place years and years and years ago because of bank issues um, <laughs> and actually being able to pay creditors and debtors. Um, given that we have the ability to have money coming in all the time, we should never be in, in the case of actually paying, in some cases, up to five or six weeks after an invoice. Um, so, you know, we are in a position where we are one of the few organisations that has cash flow and we should be leading this in terms of our community, not just blindly following 20th of the month. So even after this process is finished, I would certainly encourage us to continue paying invoices within five days. Yep. Um, if we could bring that up in the financial audit and risk, but it's a very good point. Uh, it is 1920s uh, accounting, possibly, that, that, that put us doing that. Now, Councillor Colenzo, you had a question. Um, yes, I did. Um, with, with regard to um, people applying for rates relief or, or rates um, going on plans and things like that, which, which, Katrina, I know your team do exceptionally well, I think that we need to have um, some advertising around or something on our website to say that anybody who feels that they need to apply for this facility, we, we need to advertise that we hold this confidentially, that we're sensitive to their requirements, um, that, that we will, we, we, we're, we're sympathetic to the situation they're in, but the advertising that we've done around rates relief at the moment hasn't been good. Um, it hasn't been met well with the way it is in the in the community. And I think that sensitivity and putting something very sensitive up on the uh, on the website um, is is called for. Okay, uh, do you have a comment on that before going to Brian Jepson, Councillor Jepson? Do I have a comment? Um, I, I think we need, I'll work, I'll work with Amy and Harry and together I think we, we'll need to do a better job of communicating. Yeah, I think the, the, you know, Pammy makes some good comments, but it's letting people know it's available and we are reacting uh, is really crucially important in delivering the message uh, as, as well. So uh, Councillor Jepson. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to uh, say that you know, after Marcus puts his article in the Times Age, we'll be flooded with people ringing us and asking for rate relief. So I, I, I think, look, this is a great initiative and uh, good on the team for 
<clears throat> coming up with it and Katrina and her team for uh, administering. Yeah, great job. Yeah, so, do we have any? Oh, sorry, Katrina. Sorry, I was just going to say. So, so the um, we're not proposing that we change anything. Um, the policies are already there. Lost, having Katrina. a discussion. Sorry, right. we, lost we lost you, Katrina. Oh, did you? Sorry. Yeah. So, um, if you could start that again. My apologies, it didn't tell me that. Um, I was going to say, um, we're not changing, in, we're not proposing that at this stage that we're changing any of the policies. These are tools that we already have in place. So um, I think it's about um, making sure that the community is aware that they are they are there to be used and um, that we are, we are open and sensitive to their um, situations and um, are wanting to proactively help them through this if they're genuinely in hardship. Thank, thank you. I, I think that's fantastic. I think we're all in agreement that of the way forward. Uh, councillors, if you uh, do receive any comments... Oh, sorry, Councillor Hay, you have a question. Thank you. Uh, uh, firstly, I agree with the comments that everybody have, um, have brought forward. Uh, Katrina, just a question for you. How many um, rates, rebates, uh, households do we currently have? Oh, sorry, I can't yeah. answer that. <laughs> quite, um, quite, quite a few. I know we're up to about... Um, uh, oh, sorry, Lee, I haven't got that on the top of my head. Um, no. But um, we have got quite a few, and Kirsty is um, she does proactively um, reach out to people that certainly people that have applied for rate rebates before um, to let them know that they need to the deadlines for getting those in. Okay, and just um, another question uh, around this. Um, I agree about the comms on this, and I think a lot of people aren't aware. Uh, how long? How long have we had this policy? of managing our rates in this way, case by case, which is five years or how long? Yeah, I know, a long I know time. Certainly, yeah. I don't know that it has been changed in some years. So, um, so I would I would say at least since the last LTP. Okay, because it would be a good point to emphasise in any comms. Um, just around paying suppliers faster, I completely agree with all the comments. But if I could just add one uh, thought for consideration, Let's lose local suppliers from South Wairarapa, not from the broader Wairarapa region. For example, printers, there's only one printer in South Wairarapa. It'd be good if we could, and then there'll be other sectors as well, I'm sure. Um, but if that's something that could be considered. Yes, um, absolutely. And with respect to financial contributions paid for by developers, I appreciate we want to encourage developers but that would be an area I'd feel quite nervous about um, and not something I'd like to rush into lightly um, so that was just my thoughts around that but excellent initiative is there any way we could email out to all our ratepayers or do a letterbox drop or something in terms of comms to reach those people who are not connected to any so I know team? Amy um, has been um, emailing the, the database. Is she, Amy, is that something that we could look at doing? Absolutely. We've got lots of different channels. Um, we don't have to rely on Facebook or the website. We can use email and uh, letter drops potentially. We can have a look at it. Great. Um, Sorry, I've got one more one more comment. Um, yesterday, I dropped off a um, uh, direct debit forms to three elderly lady in Greytown, ladies. Um, and on the website, it's just it's not a read write PDF, and you can't submit online. And I know we're changing the website, but is there any way we can improve that? Uh, there is. Um, something that we are looking into is being able to accept direct debit authorities via phone. Um, there are some um, 
requirements around that from the bank. One of them is that we have to be able to record the conversation and we have to keep it for seven years. So um, that's something that uh, Kirsty and I are uh, actively looking into how we could make that happen. So I still need to do some more work around that, but that is, that is an option. Um, otherwise, um, we could um, put in a um, stamped self-addressed envelope with the direct debit form so that people can post them back to us. That is another option that we could consider. Bit old fashioned, but serves purpose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. I think there was a bit of anxiety on the part of these ladies because their library's yeah. shut and yeah. you know that kind of thing at the moment. Cool. Just Thanks before we very much, account. Katrina. Cool. Just before we go to Councillor West, uh, I, there's more than one printer in the South Wairapa, uh, Councillor Hay, uh, including one in Featherston. So just just before we before we exclude um, some of our our, um, our businesses, uh, Councillor uh, West. Um, just with regards to kind of like the payment plans, is that like an automatic payment uh, ability? Uh, it would be set up, a direct debit would be set up generally. Because I um, am absolutely against direct debit because I've been burnt by it before and so I'm really hesitant. Hmm. I'm just wondering what other abilities there are. Automatic payments work really, really well for me, for instance. Sure. Um, automatic payments do work well for some people, but for other people they don't. Um, so we could look at an automatic payment. However, uh, the idea of a payment plan is that you stick to it um the i guess the problem with the automatic payments that we've had with rates for example is that people set up their automatic payment covers their rates but then they don't change it and rates go up every year but they don't change their automatic payments so suddenly they're in but i don't rates. get it because because i do automatic payments and i get a bill to say how much i've already paid yeah and then i know therefore know if i need to top it up or stop payment so i don't see what the problem is and that's great because that means that you, you you're doing it correctly but a lot of people set up an automatic payment they forget about it for five years and they just sort of go away and think that that um they look at their rates for when they just kind of Put it aside because they know they've got an automatic payment and they don't need to worry about it. But I so, still don't. I don't, still don't get it because would you not be sending me the letter saying, "Hey, look, you know, um, for whatever reason you're behind your payments." Yes, so for yes. five years is a bit, a bit on the nose. Yeah. Okay, that might have been too long. But yes, we are. Of course, we are sending them notices to say that they're overdue. Mm. Um, automatic payment is something that we could look at for um, for payment plans Fantastic. as long as as long as it's something that people commit to. Cool. Because if they, uh, effect, effectively, if they break the payment plan, then the policy says that we that therefore the they won't be able to have their penalties remitted. So the penalties would probably be reapplied if right. they're not proactively contacting us. Cool. Councillor Vickery, did you have a question? No, I was randomly flapping my hand. <laughs> right, people, if um. Uh, if we're, we're, we're done this with this one, I, I, I'd like to think that if we have any issues, please bring them through to me, councillors. If you, if you hear that, um, uh, that people aren't getting the message or are still stressing, I'm sure we can then address them uh, through comms and through uh, Katrina as well. Uh, so with that in mind, at 12.27, I'd like to uh, have a 15-minute break or 20-minute break for lunch uh, because we still have three items on the agenda and I don't want to rush things through. So... Uh, if we could reconvene at, let's just say, a nice clean quarter to one um, and to continue the meeting. Is everyone okay with that? <clears throat> yep. Uh, Pip, you're not happy with that? <laughs> are, 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 we, are we able to go and, and, and reconvene at one? Uh, uh, Councillors, do you have any objection with that? No. no Lovely. No, we'll, re we'll reconvene at one. So Thank you. I'll see you in half an hour. All right, so we've got all councillors back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's all, all of us. Good Lord. All right. Okay, so uh, it's one o'clock. We might as well start uh, back up again. So um, as per extraordinary business people, we've got the uh, item, which is the new B5, the Local Government Funding Agency Report, which we're now considering. Um, I'm going to be asking for a vote in a second, but do we have a mover to receive the reports? Uh, Councillor Colenso and a seconder, Councillor Maynard. 
Um, so Alistair, if you want to unmute yourself and Brenda, um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, uh, the motion is carried. Okay, so the purpose of this report is to report to the council regarding the local government funding agency amendments to borrowing program. And the councils recommend that we receive the port report, uh, which we have, and that we approve the documents and delegate authority to two elected members to sign on behalf of the council. Mr. Wilson, do you want to lead us through this one? I'll hand over to Katrina. Yep, <laughs> thanks Harry. <laughs> Okay, so you are all aware that we get our, um, sorry, excuse me, I'm just going to close mine. I got to close mine too. Sorry. Oops. Um, you're all aware that we um, borrow through the local government funding agency, um, and so do majority of other councils within New Zealand. Um, and so we form part of, we're one of the um, uh, trustees to the trustees. So there's lots of deeds that sit behind that that each of the councils um, um, adhere to. So they have gone away and LGA as part of their normal business have reviewed, um, uh, reviewed uh, things that they do and they feel that they can um, amend things a little bit to improve it. So they want to amend the borrowing program um, so it requires all the guarantors, which we are one of them, to, um, to amend the trustees. So these two main changes. One is that um, the council, um, sorry, LGA measure council compliance with LGA covenants at the group level rather than the parent level. Now the reason for this is um, it more, it's going to more accurately reflect the council's financial position. Um, and um, because a lot of large councils, and we're talking the Aucklands, the Queenstowns, <coughs> the Dunedin and Christchurches, um, they have um, quite a few subsidiary organisations that um, are part of them. Now, at the moment, um, LGFA only measure it at the council level, which is at the parent level. So councils are current and not looking at the whole group and measuring the financial position of the whole group. So that's what that first amendment is for, is to do that. Um, the second one is to allow CCOs, which is council controlled organisations, um, to, to borrow directly through LGFA. So at the moment, once again, with the larger councils um, who have CCOs, uh, they will borrow on behalf of their CCO and then on lend the money. Um, to the CCO. So they want to, LGFA want to tighten up on that and go, well, no, actually, for us to measure um, the, um, the financial risk of the CCO, that needs to be a separate entity. So we need to, we need to be separating that out. Um, there's another couple of little ones where they want to, the, um, and they want us to increase the borrowing notes um, for each of the loans. So when we get a loan, we have to buy some borrowing notes. Borrower notes are pretty much an investment. So we get X amount of money and a tiny portion of that is like um, a investment with our GFA that like they sort of hold us um, on our behalf. Uh, so that is essentially what um, they are asking us to do. Now this is something that we are one small council in many. Um, it's not really a should we do this, should we not do this, we need to do this. Um, it's just an amendment to the pre-existing deeds that are already in place um, for borrowing. So I've attached all of the deeds for you um, so that you can look through them. Um, as you can see, the majority of um, each council needs to sign them. So um, they're really there for you to look at and read through, um, but we're not asking this is not about, we can't change any of these recommendations. We need to pass this effectively. Yep. Oh, yeah. Councillors, do, does anyone have any uh, comments? Or Harry, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Katrina, just, uh, um, just as a question, actually, when you, in the first discussion point about enabling approved council controlled organisations to borrow directly, does that, with, um, I presume that would include Wellington Water? Yes. They potentially could have a benefit to us if they access no. low borrowing costs. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, and so my second question is given that these are things that we, um, you're saying we need to do, 
What are the benefits for us? Um, so from my point of view, I think that they tighten up on um, not necessarily loopholes, but um, it's 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 about security really and reducing reducing risk because if LGA reduces their risk and has more visibility of each council's um, borrowing position, then that benefits us because it reduces the any any perceived risk um, that's out there to us. So it's, it's really tightening up on all those loopholes as you would do in a normal business as usual situation. So sorry, um, Mr. Mayor, but um, so that would, from a finance audit and risk perspective, which we'd normally have put this through, um, mm. but the timing we wouldn't have, um, this, is, this, is a, this would reduce our risk um, potentially through these amendments. Yes. Right. Thank you, um, Mr. Wilson. Councillor Vickery, you have a question. Uh, I think I think it's been answered. But uh, as guarantor member, um, looking through this, it, it's it seems to be making funding more available to certain entities, including CCAs. Does this, does this expose us as a guarantor member at all in any way? So I guess the answer to that is that they're already doing it. It's it's um, because they're already lending to CCOs via other councils. And um, what LGFA are wanting to do is actually use the CCO as a as an individual entity and assess their their debt risk um, individually. Um, so it's my understanding that actually it's going to reduce the risk. So it's not hiding anything, it's about more transparency. Um, LGFA know that they are lending via other councils to CCOs, whether they like it or not. And this is about actually putting the framework in place to say, hey, as long as they meet our, our criteria, we can lend to them directly. That's lovely. Thanks, Katrina. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Maynard. You say that this is already in, in place. So in, in the past, uh, CCOs have already been able to access access these funds? So with all the trust deeds are in place. These are just amendments to, the, to all the deeds. Um, CCOs have borrowed um, via other councils. So, so for example, Wellington Water might go through Wellington City Council and go, hey, I need some money. Um, and so Wellington Council will organise the funds with LGFA and then pass those funds on through some sort of arrangement to the CCO. So um, does that answer your question? Uh, to, to a point, because so I guess, um, you, you know, if, um, for example, if Wellington Water was going, then Wellington Water would be sorting that debt directly rather than it going through councils, in effect. So, so for example, if they were needing to do some big work, works throughout the region, um, mm. including here, and they were taking it, it would no longer mean that the South Wadded Upper District Council and each of these people would have to put some funding in themselves. Yeah, so, so these, stop these us from having CCOs to take anything. Probably Wellington Water is not a, necessarily a good example, but a lot of the CCOs um, borrow within their own rights. Um, Wellington Water, because we own the assets, the debt would sit with us, but other CCOs, I think, operate differently. Does that make does that answer? Yeah, that, 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 that's what I was wanting to know. Would we still be carrying the debt, even even though it's not us applying for it? Yeah. Um, because, I, you know, I'd, I'd hate to see us caught up in a thing where we're expected to pay a similar amount to... To, no, it's know. all about where the underlying <laughs> asset sits. And so um, the, uh, um, with Wellington Water, the underlying asset sits with us. <laughs> so um, because we still own our assets. So yeah, any, no, that makes sense. Yeah, any debt would be yeah, ours. So if we could reverse the equation. So the, the ability is to manage the total council debt, including its council controlled organisations, mm. as opposed to just the council debt. Give you a very good example of that. Um, so. Hamilton City, some many years ago, you'll have heard of the V8 fiasco. So they sunk a whole lot of capital into, through a CCO, to one of the council in an event management, and it collapsed on them. So this is, is, is a way that our um, borrowing agent has a full um, view of council risk in a total sense, and I fully support that, because I've seen when it goes wrong. So, <clears throat> no, yeah, makes makes 
Sorry. Council, you're right. I couldn't get to my unmute button. <laughs> um, Katrina, um, you mentioned the borrowing note. So as a guarantor, we, we have to buy borrowing borrowing note. At the current at the moment, when we borrow per thousand, how many notes do we have to buy and what cost are they? I think it's 0.3 at the moment and it's going up to 0 0.5. 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, any other councillor comment or questions? Right, with that in mind then, um, sorry, That's Councillor Hay. Uh, so I think this is a good idea because I think in this current environment, anything that reduces transparency and reduces our risk, um, because things like the, um, the V8 is a classic example um, where it can go horribly wrong. Um, I presume it another example would be like ports of auckland is that right katrina would that be as an example uh i yeah i guess so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. so these these yeah. documents have have have, uh, have gone through lgfa's lawyers who are russell mcveigh and also our own lawyers who are simpson greason so um they they have gone through two sets of lawyers from both both parties um okay. to check that they are are fine yeah okay Yes, I support this. Right. Any other questions then? And we'll move to a vote to pass this. Oh, the one clarification, actually, mm -hmm. if I could, is uh, with the re the resolution is that uh, two elected members sign on behalf of council. Do we have clarity on who those uh, elected members are supposed to be, or is it anyone? It's anyone. You can nominate who you'd like. But I think could it would we... be good to have that in the resolution. I think it should be tightened up, because at the moment, two community board members could do this. Mm -hmm. uh, which might not be appropriate. So, um, is there? Could you suggest a, an amendment to that uh, motion, uh, clarifying uh, this? Uh, could it, should it be could this as two uh, elected chairs, or which would then indicate that they have a, a certain level, or is it the mayor and the head of the uh, assets and you know finance, yeah. finance committee or something like that? I mean, if we could just firm that up with a suggestion, I would be appreciated. Yeah, I think that would be um, a good idea if you did actually um, nominate who those people were that were going to sign the documents. Could I suggest um, it be the Mayor and the Chairman of the Finance Audit and Risk? Is this about yep. managing um, council finances and, and risk? Does anyone want to nod or comment on that? Uh, sorry, Councillor Colenso. Um, could I comment on that, please? Um, could we make it three elect any two of three elected members and then that covers if the one elected member is away at a time that something needs to be signed. Yep. This is going to be done immediately. So once this has been this resolution has been passed, I'll be couriering the documents to the first member and then to the second member for signing and then they'll go to the lawyers. Okay. So and and there there and then the resolution which doesn't have any ongoing effect because it's specific for this particular contract. So right. uh, yeah, we probably don't need to do that. So um, okay, so people, if we uh, pe we could go through then, if we could move to approve the documents and delegate authority to the mayor and the chair of the assets and finance committee to sign on behalf of council. Do we have a mover for this? That needs, that, needs, that needs to we, say finance, audit and risk. Sorry. Finance, finance, audit and risk committee. Sorry. sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Councillor Plymouth uh, moved, Jepson second. I'm going to ask for a verbal vote. Uh, so if you unmute yourselves. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against and abstaining, the motion is carried. Fantastic, guys. Now we're moving on to uh, item C1, the financial report. Uh, do we have a mover to receive the report? Councillor Hay and a seconder, Councillor Fox. All those, I'm going to ask for a vote. So all those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, the motion is carried. All right, so this is an information only report and we're not being asked to make a decision. I'm gonna ask Mr. Wilson to comment on the report, but my initial one was if 
Uh, is this a decision for council or should this have been run through a committee prior to coming to us in normal circumstances? Uh, Mr Wilson. I, normally this would have gone through um, finance, audit and risk. Um, but it's important at this stage of the year, um, two periods of the year, to understand where we're heading financially. Um, so um, the good news in this report is how much of a surplus um, do you have, which sounds really odd. And I think it's important that you get a head around how this reports, because um, the report of budgeted position relates to how much of a, budget, a surplus you originally budgeted. So in the original year, um, there was a significant expectation set in the last annual plan that there were budgeted surplus. Um, and you obviously know my views about um, the fact that tends to reflect some of the underinvestment and capital resources and capability and things we needed. So um, this is essentially saying we have a surplus, but we have not as much of a surplus as we anticipated for a number of extraordinary items, which you'll be well aware of, which are a lot relating to, um, first of all, water. Um, so an operating sense, not the capital investment we've had to make for Wellington Water, but an operating sense, we did things like brought forward some capability and capacity into, or capacity into Wellington Water particularly, um, following, as you'll be aware, the wastewater um, issue, um, where there was a request from Wellington Water to bring forward um, some staff capacity to make sure we had it, which the council agreed to and so forth. The other is also, this is reflecting um, building up our staff capacity um, to make sure that we've been able to respond in the way that we have. So look, I'll, I'll ask um, Katrina just to walk you through that comment, because it sounds really odd to say, we have a surplus, but not much of a surplus we wanted, which looks like a deficit. So only an accountant can explain that in <laughs> one syllable. So. I think you did a good job there, Harry. <laughs> so, so yeah, effectively what we're saying is that, um, yes, we wanted to have more of a surplus than we did. We still got a surplus, but when you, when you say you've only got a $1.3 million surplus and you're expecting to have a $2.5 million surplus, then you've got an um, unfavorable variance of um, $1.3 million at the moment. So um, that would probably make sense to Lee and um, Pam and Brenda probably who's on financial order to risk. Um, so probably easier if we just open it up to questions, I think, if you need more clarity around that or anything else. Oh, Definitely. before I do go on to that, can I just make one comment? I have actually found an error in the report um, under um, the management reports that are attached um, under miscellaneous income, which I think is probably on about the third page of the report. It actually says miscellaneous income is $438,000 favourable. It should actually be 33000 Sorry, I put an extra eight in there. So that's um, an error there. We can correct that. Shame, I thought we had a huge amount of income coming through I wasn't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll open this up to councillors for comments. Um, who would like to ask the first question? Councillor Hay. Um, <clears throat> so just looking at, um, at the uh, bottom line, actually it's just perfect budgeting in my view. We don't want money just sitting in there not being used. Um, just thinking to the year end, how do you see this tracking? Because presumably there'll be some smoothing according to costs and expenditure. How are we looking for June based on, you know, we're now um, eight months would, in? If I can answer that, Councillor Hay, um, I'd like to say that I believe that we will still be in surplus. So I don't think we'll have a deficit budget. We've got um, quite a few items that come in towards the end of the year, um, mainly uh, non-cash items that um, that we don't budget for, so they're kind of um, bonuses really. So assets vested in council is one of them, so those are um, when a new subdivision goes through, there may be some assets that need to be um, passed <coughs> on to council, um, so they get reflected and brought into um, the accounts. Um, also 
financial contributions generally go up a little bit towards the end of the year. And the other one is revaluations. So if um, the only revaluations that we're doing this year is actually our library collection. Um, that's the main one. Um, but um, those all add to the surplus. So I am expecting that we'll be running a surplus budget this year. Not as high as, as anticipated, but I believe we will still be in surplus. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> does this expenditure include the agreed amount of over expenditure that we agreed in the CEO review? Does yes, that take it does. into account this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sure we'll have some more questions, but over to anybody else. Okay. Uh, next question, please. Uh, Councillor Jepson. Uh, yes, Katrina, just, just one comment I'd like to make that when you get down to the uh, statement of financial performances and you have in there the commentary uh, unfavourable, unfavourable, I just when particularly when it is unfavourable, if you could add a little bit more commentary to it as to what it is that's caused yep. it, whether it's, um, in a lot of cases, it's work that's been uh, put forward or in some cases on the income side of it, it's NZTA um, haven't paid up yet. And if you think those things just sort of clear the air a bit in my mind as to what they actually are. Sure, we'll do that. Um, could, I, could I just say, um, Katrina, on that one? Um, JP, normally we would do just that. Um, yeah. Katrina's just walked out of the back of trying to do all the finances for the annual plan and those types yeah, of things. I, yeah, I understand. It, it would that. be the kind of information you would get under normal circumstances. Yeah. We're really trying just to um, keep keep everyone afloat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand it. It's just, you know, yeah. I picked it up last night and <clears throat> yeah. yeah, okay. Could I um, possibly as well make a comment? Is there benefit to us in convening a um, Finance Audit and Risk Committee meeting to consider this and, and give some commentary back to councillors who aren't involved in that particular committee. Um, yeah. uh, it's, it's relatively easy. We're, we're relatively um, competent now with, with Zoom. Uh, that if we could just throw this through the appropriate committee with with um, with comments back to the other councillors, I think it would be really beneficial. What does everyone else think? Mm. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. I think it's a really good idea because I've got a number of questions that we don't all want to sit here and go through. Um, yeah. but we could give an overall clarification of that. Those questions um, back to the rest of the councillors. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, are you uh, are you okay with that, uh, or Karen, uh, that we that we and well, Harry, uh, that we um, we just do that in the next couple of days, or whenever people are available, just to run through that all and then um, send some advice through to council. Well, I suggest not in the next couple of days, um, but um, I'd actually ask that even depending on what we do with our subcommittees, to me the one we should convene is definitely um, the finance audit and risk. Um, so that's a matter of making sure that um, we've got checks and balances given everything that's going on in the world with COVID-19. Um, you know, we had to approve emergency expenditure. And so I look for guidance, as you would as governors, um, from the finance audit and risk to make sure that we're making prudent decisions. So I think the agenda is much more than just this. It's to give you guys an assurance that the um, the recovery, the response plan, those types of things are being managed in a way as governors that you need to know, rather than just um, from an operating perspective. So what I'm suggesting, Mr. Mayor, is that um, rather than just do an assurance on this report, is we, we do, as a priority, convene the Finance Audit and Risk Committee um, and um, make sure that we're just running through some of those things. I, th I think that's a marvellous idea. And um, um, yes, definitely. Uh, let's just to run through the people with their pens up. Councillor Hay, then Councillor Maynard, then Councillor Ems. Oh, just a quick one on that. No, one of the things I was putting forward for a review was the frequency of the finance audit and risk. In my view, it's uh, quarterly was not enough. So I think that it needs to be passed as a matter of urgency. And I, I'd certainly be happy to meet next week if that worked with Suzanne and Katrina and the other yeah. councillors. Um, but I think we need to, you know, meet as soon as possible. We'll leave that to... Um... Katrina and, and Suzanne to see whether when their, their timing is to be able to prepare agenda, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, Councillor Maynard. Um, yeah, I think as well that, um, you know, that, that I think it's pro probably really, really a good time to um, uh, for a uh, for finance audit and risk to make just because, you know, the questions that we've had asked um, uh, also about any, you know, over, over this time, has there been any kind of non-essential council business, you know, that, that may have the potential for savings and things like that? Um, those kind of questions that are being asked, um, that, you know, anything like that found? I think it's um, quite good to to bring that up, as well as what the emergency expenditure and and, and things that has also yep. come through. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah, probably need the time for a wee revamp. Um, uh, Garrick, uh, just agreeing with Lee. Yes, I think that this is a unusual times, and we haven't had a chance to go through it. And as a member of that committee, I'm very happy to meet. And I think you're right, Lee. Probably uh, quarterly is probably a bit long, particularly under these circumstances mm. when. Things are moving quite quickly, so yes, totally agree. Cool, um, Councillor uh, 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 Councillor Fox. Great idea. Um, just because we're meeting electronically at the moment, can the invitation to the meeting still be sent to everybody? So if we want to join in, even though we don't, not a formal member of that committee, we could. So that would be the normal kind of process, but it just means that our committee. Folk have got to send invitations out to the wider council if we want to log on. Or we can log on. All right. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So um, with this with this in mind, uh, can I just um, put forward a resolution uh, that we unsuspend the Finance Audits and Risk Committee to allow for a meeting to be convened at the earliest possible convenience. Uh, did, are you okay with all that? Um, so, I'll, um, so we, that's a process we have to go through. So, uh, moved by Councillor Maynard, was that correct there, Councillor Maynard? And seconded by Councillor uh, uh, West. Uh, I'm going to ask for a verbal vote on this in um, odd resolution I just popped through. <laughs> um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 All, those, all those against, abstaining, the motion is carried. Uh, then the next question will be, um, uh, do we wish to continue discussing this or do we want to wait until that's been, the financial report has been, examined by the Finance Audit Risk Committee and then put forward any questions. Yes, Brenda? Uh, wait. I think we should wait and see what, what the... Um, the yeah. Okay. So if anyone uh, is... Ha if everyone's happy with that, could you not? Yeah. Lovely. So we shall carry on then to the final agenda mo um, thing, which is very boring, trust me, uh, which is the Mayor's report, which I will be giving verbally, <clears throat> um, because there's, of course, been limited... Uh, meetings, uh, formal meetings, and uh, and uh, we tend seem to be. I have certainly been focusing on on COVID um, over the last month and a bit. So just to let you know what I've been doing, um, we uh, have a number of uh, been working with all you councillors on a ward basis and various community board members with regards to monitoring the community. Uh, and finding any issues that needed immediate resolution or any uh, issues to be taken through to the uh, rec uh, with, to the CDEM or the Master in uh, Emergency Management Office. Uh, so you're all aware of that. Uh, we also have been having um, an information gathering uh, process uh, with uh, councillors and community boards identifying business and community issues for delivery to the recovery manager that has been progressing well uh, and I would like to, the recovery manager his office becomes official uh, at the end I think at the end of next month I think uh, but we he is starting uh, the is starting to gather information so we're going to be adding to that uh, I think pretty sure you're all aware of that um, as well I have uh, been uh, meeting with regular updates from the Wellington region of the CDEM with all the mayors of the region and a couple of um, ministers. Uh, we have also uh, had regular every second or third day uh, update meetings with the mayors and the um, uh, recovery of, uh, sorry, the um, 
uh, emergency management office in, in, in Masterton. Uh, I'm sure that out of that will come some key learnings for the next civil emergency to make this a bit smoother, but certainly it's been a learning experience for me being on the first end of one of these. Additionally, there have been a number of uh, Waiapa Economic Development uh, Group meetings, WEDs, governance meetings, and they, they have been quite constant. I think they're going to be a, a big part of any economic recovery, not necessarily a social recovery. Um, they have attended two week meetings of the Wellington Water Committee, uh, which is more on updates on uh, the status quo and any issues as opposed to making any broad decisions on governance uh, with their re re uh, reaction to COVID. Uh, we've also implemented every second day uh, the three mayors of the WIRAP are meeting to make sure that um, our concerns over COVID and any recovery are being conveyed to the correct uh, um, to the correct uh, departments. Uh, there was an initial feeling that because it was a statutory appointment um, within the uh, Civil Defence Emergency, uh, that the mayors were cut out of any uh, information and we've managed to resolve those issues that may have been there in the first two weeks. Uh, I have also met with the Murray Standing Committee in a hui, an informal hui, just regarding their involvement in a lot of these uh, um, initiatives and uh, I have some actions, one of which was the invitation for the whole Maori Standing Committee to be invited to this meeting today. And there are a number of others as well with regards to the recovery that I'm going to um, uh, see, see where they stand on that. Uh, as well, um, well, the other, I can't actually announce it yet, but I think we may have a bit of good news. Uh, Councillor Plimmer and myself are working on a 0% youth unemployment for the South Wire Upper Initiative. Uh, which was our first meeting to progress this was um, stymied by COVID uh, and we had to delay it. Uh, but it looks like we may be um, getting some action on this uh, as part of any uh, reaction to the recovery. And I, I should have something, some good news for you next week uh, with that one. Uh, so that's really my mural report. It's, it's been eight to 10 hour days every day for the last month. Uh, but to be honest, all of you councillors have stood up and I'm very happy, uh, very impressed with what we've managed to get done, including the community boards and certain members of the community. So uh, well done. So that's my mural report. If you've got any questions or if you, were, if, uh, if you want any clarification for anything, uh, you can also send me an email at Councillor um, West. Um, I just want to acknowledge that Harry was, uh, like yourself, was chucked into the deep end and he really rose to the occasion. And I just really want to acknowledge that um, your efforts have not gone unnoticed and that we appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you, Councillor West. Yeah, um, from a staffing perspective, it's certainly been actually busier than um, normal. Um, even though we've had staff working from home and our computer systems and our systems are frankly appalling. Um, people, have, we've managed to cobble it together and keep things going really well. I just want to assure you, Alex and I are certainly in touch every day, um, sometimes two or three times a day, and um, we keep in close contact. So, um, and I try as best as I can to make sure that you're advised of um, what's going on nationally and where things are significant that you need to know about. So it's been a very busy time for the staff. Um, I do reiterate my apology about late council papers, um, but you've got to recognise that in that context. Um, people are working really hard. I just take my hat off to the executive team. Um, it, it's a team effort, and um, I'm very proud of our team and what they've been able to do. Thank you, Harry. Very good. A nice little... Any other questions, um, councillors of the mayoral report, or anything else you'd like to raise before we convene the meeting? Uh, we, we close the meeting. Councillor Colenzo. Um, I'm not sure you worship whether we're allowed to do this or not. Um, I just sent through a message to Suzanne and she's asking Karen. Um, we unsuspended the um, finance audit and risk. Um, is there um, an option to unsuspend the planning in the regulatory committee? Um, 
and I asked this on the basis of the information and the discussion around the spatial plan so that um, we can talk as a committee as, as well as with Russell and his team um, as, as to progressing that and the suggestions that have been made to, to make those um, changes and incorporate more people. Is, is that something that we are able to do or not able to do? Um, I can refer back then possibly to uh, Karen to uh, comment on this, if you could. Um, certainly, Mayor. Um, well, ordinarily, of course, we would have an agenda item, so we could take in some advice from Suzanne on uh, on whether this is, you know, because it's not um, ideal to have extraordinary business um, come through um, in this way, and that we would probably need to give it some more thought. But we have. Um, saying that we have um, unsuspended or reactivated the uh, FAR committee um, for very good reason. So um, council would just need to consider whether we think that there is um, sufficient work of, um, of an essential nature, given that we're still in um, alert level three uh, for the committee to be considering. Um, I take the point that Councillor Fox um, wanted to extend the invitation out to, uh, to the wider group. Um, um, but my view might be that then uh, if all of councillors want to participate in those discussions, whether that's something that we ordinarily would then carry on putting to a council meeting. Um, so it's really just taking your views on that, uh, Mayor. My views are that um, we unsuspended the um, FAR committee for a very good reason because there's an, uh, an active items coming up. The, with regards to the assets and services we have, um, well, sorry, planning and regulatory, uh, the issue that was raised today regarding the spatial plan now has a, a um, month to three month timeline with regards to getting back to us on any actions items as a result of this meeting. So whether or not there is, uh, that might put in, uh, there's an, an, a pressing need for that to be reconvened and whether <clears throat> that might add an additional workload to council offices uh, once it's activated that it, that it has a flow and effect on requirements for meeting time. So uh, it, it's not necessarily something I, I feel that is essential at this, at this point, Councillor Colenso, though I understand where you're coming from. Uh, any other comments, people? Sorry, Councillor Hay, then Councillor Fox, then Councillor Jepson. <laughs> uh, just a point around um, the FAR Committee. Anybody can attend from in the council, but they don't have speaking rights. It's the only thing. And just a technical Karen Suzanne question: Do we have to advertise the results of this meeting, and therefore we'll have to record it and have it on YouTube? I'd imagine. Is that correct? Um, sorry, the answer is yes. If it's if it's constituted as an official council meeting, yes, we do. <laughs> and so we just do the same procedure as we're doing now today. Yes. Councillor Fox? Councillor, I addressed my first um, question, was uh, except that we don't have voting rights, but I think there would be some merit to actually being able to be involved in that conversation right now, obviously as a silent partner as well. Um, uh, just if we don't kick off with um, planning and reg committee again, what I'd be really interested to have is some sort of an interim report because I can see at some point we're going to end up with an absolutely enormous agenda to try and work through. And uh, I think it would be really difficult to work through a, a larger agenda than what we've had today across Zoom. Um, I'm just conscious of the fact that um, the, it would be really, really hard to conduct a meeting with all of the information coming in in a timely manner for us to pick up on it all. Um, and it's, it might be useful to think about um, whether there are some specific things that could come into that committee that could be considered um, in an interim um, report or can be put back to full council. That, that's all. About managing everyone's workload. Okay, um, Councillor Jepson, then we might come back and have a discussion on that. Or oh, Karen, actually, do you want to address Councillor Fox's question? 
yes, j just to, for information that we are currently working through um, as an organisation what level three and what level two uh, means for, for officers and for council itself. And part of that is discussions around <coughs> committees and, um, and when we're moving back to uh, when the order um, that enables us to have these meetings are online, um, it, it ceases. If it's not continued, then effectively we're back into public meetings. Um, so of course we need to be, we're giving current thought to um, the programme of meetings, uh, how we meet. Um, and so we can come back to you quite soon on that. And I certainly take the point from <laughs> Councillor Fox that yes, there's going to be a, a very large build up of, of work if, um, um, if we don't get back to meetings soon. So we'll need to have a think about how to, to address that. Okay. So, I mean, perhaps if we can get a feeling for what uh, requirements are coming up um, from you, Karen, and then we can always uh, form an extraordinary council meeting to reactivate our planning and regulatory if we feel that's needed. Um, I, I know that might be a bit ungainly when we could do it now, but I don't want to, uh, it, it, like you said, um, Karen, have un uh, notified agenda items popping up willy nilly. Uh, Councillor Jepson. Uh, thanks, Alex. <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to uh, give you an update where we are with assets and services. I've been uh, speaking and emailing Ewan. Uh, Ewan is putting together a report on what's happening and what's happened and uh, how the tracking on with jobs. So the intentions are I'll get that report out in the next day or two. But what I want to remind councillors, if there's something they need to know more about, Ewan is quite happy to answer it via an email. So it's just to give you a progress report. I don't think at this stage we need to think about reconvening the um, asset and services, but we'll keep you posted if there's an issue. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Jepson. Councillor Plymouth. Just to answer um, Pam's query, one of the reasons we stopped the talk about the spatial plan was we wanted to wait until we got some idea about uh, what the recovery plans are going to look like from both Wellington and central government, because that will impact upon us. So until those come out, there's really not much more to talk about, and then they're not due out for a few weeks yet. So um, once they come out, then then I agree with you, Pam. That's probably then time to say, well, get the committee together and say, what effect is that going to have on the spatial plan going forward? Yeah, no, I mean, it was a good point from Councillor Clenzo. We should have, it's a good discussion, actually, as to why and, and how and, and when. Um, right. Um, do we have anything else? And I don't want to close this meeting too quickly, like I tried to last time, and, and missing out anything that's important. So does anyone have anything else uh, to raise as per the agenda uh, as much as possible? Agenda. It's not agenda. Is it, no, is it we brief and before. light and friendly and positive? <laughs> I hope everyone's having a lovely day out there. Uh, no, it was the, the comment about uploading stuff to, to YouTube and recording meetings, but we're going to talk about that outside of this, aren't we? I think we'll do a distribution to, uh, on, on, uh, on the reaction and any issues one may have. Now we've had two full council meetings online uh, and how other councils would do some research on other how the councils are, are dealing with them and what LG NZ says about that. So, yeah. Uh, Councillor Maynard. I just wanted to say that um, I think that the that, that these meetings are working really well and it's quite nice because it feels like it touch, it's touching base with everyone, which is really lovely. Um, mm. it's, really, it's really great to see everyone in the, in the individual bubbles and, and looking so well. And the other thing that I completely forgot to mention was, was what a wonderful day it still was for Anzac. So, mm. you know, um, not, normally, normally I would have said that at the start and I, it just completely left my mind, but... It, it seemed like, you know, the, the dawn parade and everyone going out to their little boxes and mm. all of the feedback, again, was really, really positive. It was just a, it, it, it was time to reflect and just take that little bit of time out and, and still engage with your neighbours, you yeah. know, um, who are all at their, at their little boxes as well. And, and so, you know, in a way, that, that was really nice for the community. Mm. Uh, thanks. And on that, I think when uh, level three is lifted and level two is around, I'd actually invite all the councillors to come with me and uh, lay a number of wreaths around the South Wairarapa uh, in remembrance that we were unable to attend on, on Anzac Day. But with all that, guys, I want to thank you very much. Um, I think this has been an excellent meeting and we've covered a lot of ground. And, uh, uh, and thank you and we'll see you at the next one.
Cheers.